to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Monday, March 18th. Happy belated St. Patrick's Day to all. Um, I'm, we too often have to start meetings like this, but I am going to start and ask everybody for a moment of silence. We lost a, a member of our tree committee uh, recently, and um, wonderful, wonderful uh, gentleman by the name of Brian Muzzy Murray. And uh, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask everybody just for a moment of silence for Brian. Thank you very much. May God have mercy on his soul. Um, now the other thing is um, good news. Uh, we have a new grandmother in the house. And uh, she's looking tired over there, so you can look up at the board, and I bet you can guess which member of the board I'm referencing. <laughs> uh, but uh, she didn't actually deliver the baby herself. A young uh, grandson that came in at eight ounces, uh, from what I understand. Well, but, eight uh, pounds, one ounce. Eight ounces. <laughs> eight ounces. <laughs> eight ounces. <laughs> actually, I did deliver that. Yeah. <laughs> See, I came in at eight ounces, so it's, it's uh, you can tell by my size today. But uh, please, nice round of applause and congratulations to Diane. Thank you. Any details uh, up all night? Or? Well, I told you some of them back there. I don't know if I should repeat it. No, but everyone came home healthy and happy and wise. And uh, John Anthony is his name. Um, and he's a very good baby. He's the perfect baby. He was over for St. Patrick's Day with 16 people, and he slept through the whole thing. So nice. thank you, everybody. I appreciate your good wishes. Thank you, Kevin. They were all perfect at that point. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll do the consent agenda, and then we have an introduction to make. So first of all, for approval, the consent agenda. First of all, we have reappointments of the Allenton Historic Districts Commission, David Baldwin, Jonathan Nyberg, and Martha Penzenek. A uh, request for the Hardy School PTO Walkathon on May 3rd, uh, Betsy Crimmins Walkathon Committee. A request for two one day all alcohol licenses for March 23rd for the Quiz Night annual fundraiser and 426, a $10,000 drawing at Arlington Catholic High School. And then finally, a request for a one day all alcohol license for March 30th, comedy music benefit for the Patriots Day Parade at Robbins Memorial Town Hall Auditorium. Is anybody here wishing to speak on any of those events? Uh, David Baldwin, I just want to... Yeah, yeah, no, no, come on, you've got to come forward to the mic. Sorry, David. Hi, I'm uh, David Baldwin, and I'd just like to thank you for the, uh, the honor and the responsibility for being on the commission. Uh, we take the stewardship of Arlington's historic properties uh, very seriously, and if you have nothing to do on the fourth Thursday of the month, uh, you're welcome to attend one of our marathon uh, meetings at the Whittemore Robbins House. <laughs> Thank you, David. Very Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you for your service to the town. How about anybody else on any of these events want to talk about? Okay, a motion to approve the consent agenda, please. I move approval subject to all conditions as set forth. Is there a second? Uh, second. F further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, we have Carol Kowalski with us tonight to do an introduction, please. Thank you very much for making time on your agenda tonight. You're well aware that we've embarked on a comprehensive long-range master plan, and we now have our master plan consultant under contract, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to meet Judy Barrett from Community Opportunities Group. Judy? Hi. Good evening. Judy Barrett, Community Opportunities Group. I'm really excited to be here. We're just starting the process. Actually, I think you may know we have our first meeting with the master plan committee tomorrow night. Um, so that's probably going to be a very, uh, you know, exciting uh, time for them as well as for us. Um, our team consists not only of folks from my firm, uh, we're based in Boston, but we have Howard Stein Hudson um, and David Gamble, an architect, and Ezra Glenn, who will be coming in uh, to assist with the public participation process um, as well. Just a little bit of background about us. Um, my company does municipal planning. That's really what we specialize in. Uh, we love to come into communities and talk about planning issues. Um, so, uh, you know, we always sort of start out trying to think about what are the things that make this client kind of unique and what will be the unique challenges facing this particular community. And certainly here, I think one of the obvious ones is you're a maturely developed and a densely developed community. And um, Thinking about that as both a challenge and an opportunity, I think, will be 
kind of an integral part of the, the process. So we're just excited to be here. Can I ask my question? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can ask me questions too, by the way, which is <laughs> fine. But uh, we're trying to get a sense of what uh, people in the community are anticipating as sort of challenges that will need to be addressed in the plan or that might come up at some point. And I wondered if you'd like to weigh in on that as long as I'm here tonight. Particular <laughs> challenges that you think might come up in this process. How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We'll be concise tonight, and, and there'll be more opportunity later, but I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I was going to say, uh, the, like so you talked about the, um, the fact that we're mature and we're well-developed, I think that I would specifically relate that to the density mm -hmm. and how it relates to um, we have businesses and residences right up against each other and residences and residences and public transport and bike trail, like everything's like right on top of each other mm -hmm. and uh, people end up stepping on each other's toes all, a lot. And so I find that as a board, we often are dealing with things like trying to allocate or share those really scarce resources. And so. I think about things like um, parking, parking and noise and like that type of quality of life issue all the time. Okay. Oh, and I think if you were, I mean, I'd echo a lot of what Dan says. I think if you were to stay here and listen to some of the warrant articles, you hear about that contention for resources and, yep. and uh, you know, residential, um, you know, the residential nature of the, the town, but also mm -hmm. the very dense nature. Uh, you know, we had a large uh, public forum October 17th? Half, half an hour, yeah. yeah. Half, yeah. half a year ago or so. And um, with a lot of people come out, there's a lot of interest. I think folks do feel um, that the town is in transition, that, that there is a lot of, on the one hand, uh, development pressure, but there are a lot of natural resources they want to uh, right. preserve as well. Right. Um, heard a lot about Arlington's walkable nature mm -hmm. and the need to really develop the commercial um, real estate base as well. I think that mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of interest in, in uh, developing the, the, the commercial uh, real estate base here so that, uh, you know, there are jobs for people who, who are we'll living live here. here. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Okay. Stephen, um, I actually think that my colleagues covered the top concerns of it. I've been fortunate enough to serve on the master planning committee, so I'm um, sure That's that we'll be yeah. getting to know each other very well. Over right. The next, I'll see you uh, tomorrow night, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And just very briefly, and it's really on the outskirts, but it gets to residential versus commercial tax base and how we could look at things differently. And I know you're working in concert with ATED, the Tourism Economic Development Committee, and one of the driving forces of that, um, and Clarissa Rowe was on the board at the time, is when we got the federal funding for um, the National Registry and with Concord and Lexington. And one of the things that I've said for years and years, and other people have too, is how do we get our visitors into Arlington? And how do we link in the hotel, the new tavern that's going there? Mm -hmm. We have so much history along the trail. How do we get the buses to pull in? Right. You know, I checked in Lexington because they have a place to pull in. So a couple of times we tried to get the municipal parking lot designed so a bus could pull in right mm -hmm. by the visitor center. Mm -hmm. And that's how you fill up. I mean, we're doing well with restaurants, but that's how you fill up the hotels and get more. Everyone quotes different things, you know, for every five dollars you get twelve dollars whatever the thing is so right. that's sort of on the outskirts but that was one of one of the driving forces of what can we develop besides the industrial zone yep. up in the heights which I'm, i'll talk to you about that I, I can go on for 20 minutes about flag companies but i'll get some time one-on-one -on -one with you okay through the manager yeah and carol thank you um welcome and thank you very much uh, so you deal with a lot of boards of selectmen and yes and many councils. yeah Many. Are you already noticing a sparkling difference in the room tonight? <laughs> yes, you were, you were spontaneous and you had great answers and I appreciate so, it. Do you have questions for me or anything? The, well, sure. not really questions because uh, this is something we're all very committed to and will mm -hmm. be a part of as, as we go along. Yeah. So, uh, but I certainly hope you're used to communities that like to talk things out and out and out. And out. And out, yes. Uh, what's, what is the end product? Uh, as in, will we be sending a master plan, uh, some sort of a book to all Arlington residents? Uh, well, the, the, the physical product is, is a report, but I call it a plan. And I try to get people to not think about it as a report and rather to think about it as a plan, because if that's what you think of it as, then you're more act, apt to act on it. Um, the actual structure of the document, the physical product, 
uh, I think is something we're going to want to talk to you about, what works best for you. There's different ways you can package this. Mm -hmm. um, some communities have a great big book. Some people break it up into a couple. Um, we had a, a client once that wanted uh, a big map that sort of identified almost like a presentation type map. When you, so you walked in the town hall and the key ideas in the plan were annotated on that map mm -hmm. so that if you didn't see the book, then you at least had a sense of what the big issues were in the plan. So I think we're going to be looking to you folks for some guidance on what do you want. Um, yeah, um, you know, I mean, the key, I think, to every one of these plans is the implementation element or the implementation program. And so we put a lot of effort into that. We actually start with that. I think a lot of people think implementation comes at the end, but actually implementation starts at the beginning of a plan. So we're going to be thinking a lot about working with the committee and the rest of you on what is your capacity to implement. And you know, you've got these challenges, then you have these needs, and then you have capacity. And how do you bring all that together so that you end up with a plan you can actually carry out? Um, so the actions get laid out typically in a plan in sort of tabular form, but also in very sometimes baby steps. You know, you want to get here, but you have to do these five things first. And how does that look? What resources do you need? And so forth. So. Okay. All set. Okay. Thank you very much, Carol. Thank you very much for being thank here. You. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Good luck. We'll see you again. Okay, so now we move to licenses and permits. We have a public hearing. The first one is a request for an all alcohol license and common victualers license for Hunan Hun Lin Sono Restaurant Inc. God, I hope I'm close. Sono Asian Cuisine. Hello? Sorry about that. We were a popular night tonight. Uh, good <laughs> evening, everyone. I'm Chris Coleman on behalf of the applicant. The uh, location of the property we're talking about is uh, 469 Summer Street. It's, uh, for you if not familiar with it, I know it's a long street, right where uh, Forest comes right out into it is that building that uh, is being renovated right now. Uh, the suite itself for the location of the restaurant has uh, about 1,807 square feet. About 12 of that, 1,200 of it is on the first floor. is a small basement where there'll be some prepping of food. It's, it's Asian cuisine is what they're proposing. Um, there's 50 seats proposed. Uh, 40 will be at the tables. 10 will be at a sushi bar. There will be no lounge bar. Um, the proposed manager is here with me, uh, Wu Chen. He has excellent restaurant experience from 2006 to 2010. He was a liquor server at uh, Saki Japanese Restaurant in Portsmouth, New Hampshire from uh, 2010 to 2011. He's been a sushi chef at uh, Feng Shui Restaurant, and that's in Chelmsford. And currently, he is a sushi chef at Oi's Restaurant, which is located in Reading. He's uh, tips trained. He is a U.S. citizen, plans on spending 40 hours plus at the restaurant. Um, the, I believe the department heads have weighed in. I'm sure you have copies of those as well as, uh, as of the floor plan and the menu. Um, I think we'll be ready, or they will be ready, if assuming there's a positive vote, approximately three to four months. And I, I think they'll be ready to open at that time. And we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Mr. Kiro. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm glad to see that some plans uh, to fill that space. I have to say it's, it's been vacant for a while. Um, it wasn't clear from the plans. Are you looking to take all three of those slots there, or, or just part of the space? I believe it's only two. It's two. Yeah, this, I'd say half of the building is what it looks like to me. Half of it, okay. okay. There's a small small suite on the side for the, I think it's a pizza place, but I think there'll be one other in there. Okay. And, and I gather um, uh, from some of the plans you gave us that you do plan to um, provide some direction to the parking that's around back behind the building? Absolutely. Yeah. We'll be working closely with the building department on that. We've we got a little work yet to do. Well, well, sorry, just on that, will that be refinished, do you know? I've been behind there recently. Uh, I was just there tonight, and I hope it will be. Yeah. It will be. It'll be asfalted and, okay. and striped. Hold on, Mary. All right, I'll um, get to you. Okay. Okay. Mary, Mary. Oh, Mary, okay, Mary, please. Mary Lynn Stanley O'Connor. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Hello, members Mary. of the board. Mary uh, O'Connor, I represent the owners of this property at 469 Summer mm -hmm. Street, the Summer Realty uh, Services. Um, there will be 17 spaces. They have had that parking lot engineered for 17 spaces. They require 13 spaces for 50 seats under the Arlington Zoning Bylaw. 
There is the Arlington Cafe there that has two tables that would require uh, one space under the bylaw. There is 600 additional square feet that they are trying to tenant. Um, the gentlemen that own this space have spent a lot of money, as you know, redoing the facade. Uh, they have owned it since June of 2008. They have marketed this space for the past three years. The only other prospective tenant other than this prospective applicant and tenant is, if you recall in June, the liquor store that came that made application. There has been very little interest in this location. Um, so naturally, my clients um, are eager to tenant the space and get some uh, livelihood uh, there. I will, I'm sure there are some neighbors here to speak on this, but I would just point out one important facet of this. Um, you were talking about the density of the town. Mass Ave, Warren Street, Broadway, Downing Square, we have commercial storefronts in front of, on all of those streets and residences behind it. We can take precautions with fencing and the like to address, and uh, the dumpster service would like to address those issues. But um, my clients are interested and are very interested in um, putting in this establishment. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. It was Stephen, so yeah, yeah. go ahead. And I see both of you. Yep. Yeah. No, um, I'd like to echo Joe's statement that I'm very happy to see, you know, an applicant for this, um, for this space as it has been empty for a while. And I'm glad that you will be utilizing that parking. I know that was a um, big concern with. Um, you know, <coughs> tenant of appl applicants was that there was nowhere to park and there is ample parking behind and I'm glad that it is being redone because as you know many of us drove through there when um, the liquor store was you know a tenant of application so I'm um, uh, no I'm very happy to see um, that this space will be utilized thank you Ms. Mahan. Um, thank you and welcome and uh, my question sort of centers around the delicate balance between the business that we do want to see somebody there and the uh, neighbor, neighbors and residences and this has been accomplished before but I just wanted to ask I see that you have um, Sunday through Monday so the whole week you're staying open till 1 a.m. Um, is that your intention we just put the out the hours of the license is what we what we had put on the application right um, but what, what are you at because what I'm thinking of is if you know there are budding houses and families and homes and if you're running like some people say um, I think there's a few businesses that may stay open to 1 a.m., but they stop their serving at 11, and they're doing takeout, and it's limited so that it's not. And they have also taken steps to sort of not soundproof it, but to make the activity so it's not so much in the back. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, can you, can you expand on that? <coughs> Or if you want, if there are neighbors here, if they want to discuss that, no, we'll, is that okay? we'll let the neighbors speak in the middle, but let them answer. I no, Mr. I don't want to. Waiting too. Oh, I think sorry. we can uh, we can accommodate that. We just uh, had a brief conversation during the week. Probably 10, 10:30 is when all they'd be open till. I'd say maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Maybe be open as late as 11:30. Okay. But it's not going to be a one o'clock plant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Okay. Um, so, first of all, I'm very excited to see the plan. I'm very excited to have that face, space filled. Um, it's walking distance from my house, and I enjoy Arlington Cafe, but it's nice to, you know, have, have something else. So I'm, I'm really glad to see you try, coming in. I do have a few things, though, that I think are important that we should talk about. Uh, first off, um, there are a number of conditions in the reports from the various department heads. Like, uh, you don't have the, the dining plan isn't complete yet, and, uh, the, of course, the signage plan isn't complete. And so I'm prepared to make a motion that says approval con subject to all conditions. Of course. And, and so I just want to be really clear that those conditions are still attached. Um, I'd like to talk about attaching a condition that the, the, uh, the parking lot be repaved because I don't think it's usable in the current state. And so, but before I like make a statement like that, okay, I'm seeing nodding from Mary. Okay, thank you. Um, and... I guess I have two, so, kind of, so having said that, I've got two pieces of advice. One is work with your neighbors early. Uh, your neighbors need to, they need to love you and they need to support you. And so make yourself really available. What I would suggest is going around with phone numbers and, and knocking on doors and saying, hi, I'm moving in. If you have any noise complaints, if you have any issues or something like that, here's how you get me. Because you really want that first call to be you, not to me. Because when it goes to you, you can fix it. When it goes to me, then, then it's a problem. Uh, and the second thing I'll say is that, uh, so we did a sting operation last year and we found four restaurants that served underage p 
people. Each one of those was because of a new person who ha wasn't yet fully trained. And so another thing is, well, I'm delighted that you're here. I don't want to see you here to talk about an alcohol violation. So it's very important you remain vigilant about that training, even after you open and continuing through your operation. And other than that, I wish you immense success. And serve me good food, please. <laughs> so uh, are there any neighbors or anybody here wishing to speak on this matter, sir? Name and address, please, if you would. I'm from Glenbrook. My name is Jim Sickles. Yes, sir. And I live directly in back of the restaurant. Okay. I have a couple of questions. First of all, is the board aware that the fact that that area is a problem with water? That, there's three homes and, and, the, and the store that's there. They constantly are having water problems. And if any water gets in the cellar, you got a mold problem. They have a, they just put in some kind of a sump pump, but the sump pump just pumps it out onto the la uh, land that's available right there. And it also goes on the sidewalks out on Summer Street. I just like to bring that to someone's attention because it's a very important thing with food that no mold is available on any food. Yes, sir. Secondly, Right now, there's one dumpster in the back of the sub shop. And the truck that goes in there to get that dump, dumpster, he has, without any cars in there, he has a hard time making the turn to get that dumpster emptied. I don't know where they're going to put this one. If they're going to share the one that's there, and if there's any cars in there, they're not going to be able to get in there to dump it. That's a very important thing. The grease buckets. The sandwich shop has, I think, three grease buckets that he puts against his wall. Where's the grease buckets going to go for this here restaurant? These are points that I think that someone should address. And then here they are turning down, a few years ago, the liquor store. And it's across the street from a baseball diamond. And when the baseball people are playing ball, they're the kids. They generally come in there and park anywhere they can find a space. And the place is jammed on Summer Street. And they also come into our complex, which we have a sign up saying that it's private and we'll tow their cars, have their cars towed. You're going to have a worse problem now because when they go in that parking lot to park to go in there and get food, and there's too many cars in there, they're going to go out on the street, and during the summertime, with the baseball field playing ball, it's going to be a, a big mess. I'm not condemning them, but it's addressing, I think that the board ought to address these uh, thoughts that I'm pointing out to you people. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Mary, you'll bring this in terms of the redesign in the back there and some of these issues that were brought up. And we'll refer to Adam if the Board of Health maybe has to take a look at grease buckets or whatever it is uh, that's also out there in the back. Anybody else wishing to speak on this? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Mary Descano. I live at 15 Glenbrook Lane. I have similar concerns uh, as Jim, primarily the waste is a big concern in the summer. How often do those dumpsters get cleared out? Do they get cleared out once a week like ours? And if so, I would imagine that's a problem. I'm a teacher. I'm concerned about having alcohol right there with kids across the way. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's a big concern for me. So those are two issues that are very big. And I agree with Jim about the oil. What happens to that? And what about the exhaust fan from the restaurant? We're right behind these guys. And it is all rocks there right now. We built a fence. We just replaced it several months ago. So I'm concerned that it's going to bring down our property values and that children are going to be affected by the liquor. Thank, Thank you. you. 
And, and you heard my colleague, they must be TIPS trained, and if there is any service of alcohol to minors, they will lose that license. We don't fool around on stuff. As Dan mentioned, we had four restaurants in front of us. They all lost their license for three days. First, uh, first strike, second time, they will probably lose the license. So uh, we don't fool around on, on stuff like that, and I'm sure you understand that, and you already referenced that, uh, Council. Um, anybody else wishing to speak on this? Move approval. Sub oh, I'll second Mr. Dunn. So I apologize. Second Mr. Dunn's motion. Okay. Subject to all conditions. So I uh, move approval. Subject to all conditions as set forth. It is very important to us. The residents are first in this town, and then it's uh, businesses. But we need to encourage businesses. Property values are also affected by empty storefronts as well as they are by vibrant ones. So, uh, you know, we, we've heard these concerns before. We will make sure the Board of Health. Uh, we'll inspect, there will be more uh, inspections going on. Uh, the uh, owner's council has assured us that they will be uh, repaving in the back there, and I'm sure that they've heard all of these concerns as well. Anything else, sir? Did you want to respond to any of all these? All set, thank okay. you. Okay, so, well, might you just um, uh, talk about the exhaust fan? Are, are you familiar with where it will be, or is that a roof thing? Or? Actually, I'm not familiar with the location, <laughs> but we'll certainly work with the Board of Health to, to make sure that that's as and, and keep it away from benign, residents benign as, as much possible as humanly for any possible. Of the neighbors. Yes. Okay. All those in favor uh, of the motion and, and subject to all conditions as said forth, please say aye. 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 All those opposed. Uh, thank you for choosing Arlington. Best of luck with your business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another uh, request for a common victualler's license. Um, for those of you aren't familiar, that, uh, uh, the uh, victualler's license is the ability to serve food. This is Anthony uh, Massey of Anthony's Eastside Deli. Uh, John, did I say it right? Massey, yeah. Mr. John Hurd, Jr., welcome, sir. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is John Hurd. I'm here with my client, Anthony Massey, who's looking to open an Italian deli and food service shop in East Arlington. Mr. Massey is a lifetime Arlington resident also married to another lifetime Arlington resident. And he, previous to his current job, he owned a Italian food sh specialty shop similar to the one that he's looking to open in East Arlington in, on Winter Hill in Somerville. So we believe that this is a, will work really well in East Arlington right now. It's filling a void on Mass Avenue, East Arlington, that um, it hasn't been there in a while. And he's got great response from everyone in East Arlington and across the town that we've talked to, there's a lot of expectations, a lot of people looking, asking when it will be open, stopping in the store as the construction goes. And um, so we think this will do very well in East Arlington and um, we're open to any questions from the board. Thank you. Uh, under full disclosure, I would like people to know that John Hurd Jr. is also my campaign manager, but uh, he, he didn't threaten to quit or anything uh, mm -hmm. over this, so we haven't had any discussions. Uh, samples, Mr. Matthew? Nothing yet. Maybe next week. <laughs> Look at me. Can't you tell how to win my vote here? Uh, but so it's a real deli, right? Good pastrami, you know. Yep. New Chicken York pie. delis, be, be jealous. Boys head meats, to-go mm -hmm. meals, grab and go, salt, uh, sandwiches, hot and cold. Yep. Italian Great. specialties. Great. Mrs. Mahan. Um, first, I'd like to make a motion approval. Um, yep. uh, also, subject to all conditions. Uh, my only Second. question is, uh, I see that you list, I just want to make sure it's just the court reporter and me. Yep. You list um, on the application Monday through Sunday, 8 through 8, and then in your menu you list, and this is for either, either council, in your menu, your catering menu, you list two days starting at 7.30 a.m. Um, should the application be 7.30, should it be 8 to 8 on the five days? What I'm saying is where the catering men menu starts a half hour before what's in this application, I want to make sure you have the right permit um, that covers, and is, is that the actual? That's a typo error oh, okay. on the catering menu. Okay, I just want to make sure your catering yeah. menu fits with ours, so, so you're comfortable with the 8A to 8B? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. With that, okay, I just, all right, so then I'll disregard that, thank you. Mr. Carroll? Um, I, think, I think I'm good, I just, I noticed one of your, uh, one of your specials there is called the Broadway, you might want to uh, add a Mass Ave there too, <laughs> while you're at it. but uh, I, I have no questions, I, I walked past the place yesterday and 
it's a hub of activity, so I wish you luck. Are any neighbors here wishing to speak on this issue, on this uh, particular license? On the motion, then, by uh, Mrs. Mahan, seconded, I think, by Mr. Kiro, or was that Mr. Dunn? Mr. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you for choosing Arlington. When are you hoping to open, sir? Over the end of this week. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh. Wow. You're hmm. cutting it close. <laughs> <laughs> Paycheck. Well, paycheck. wait a minute. It's like I, the cold cancer. Minute. I think I want to table this uh, <laughs> until our May fit. No, you're all set. You got it. Thank, Thank you. Good you. luck. Will you have one Thank more quick? Will you have some nice prosciutto for uh, Easter? The palm. I, I will have Excellent. the palm. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Corn beef. Thank you, board. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, John. And we have one more a request. Carmen Vitriller's license, Anish Bambi, at, uh, for yummies. Everyone. I'm Anish Bambri looking to open Yummies in Arlington Center at the uh, former uh, something extra space and looking to open a self serve frozen yogurt shop. Okay. And uh, just about myself, I've been in Arlington uh, doing business in Arlington for like seven years. I own the Sprint store, which used to be Verizon before, and now we convert it into Sprint. And we have done businesses like Senton, Bedford, and in this area. Can you tell me how self-service works for yogurt? Basically, uh, where you know people just vend it themselves from the machines directly. Yeah. They put their own toppings on top of the yogurt of their own choice, and then we basically they weigh it on the scale, and they pay us for the the weight of it. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? No. Yeah, um, was there a motion? I haven't made it. Not yet. Um, I'd like to move approval, subject to all conditions, and just a brief comment. Um, it seems to be the trend, the frozen yogurt shops. Yes. I know a lot of Arlington women, I've yet to go because I'm trying to have uh, ventured over to Winchester, and you will now be the second so, uh, mm -hmm. yogurt, soft serve yogurt yes. shop in Arlington, there's one right by the high school. So yep. it's sort of like the new trend thing, mm -hmm. and you, it's supposed to be you know, guiltless free mm. calories you know, because of the frozen yogurt, but then you add all those M&Ms. So it's a, it's a real big trend, and I, I yep. wish you much success. I'll get worried so if we much. have more yogurt than we do banks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll second, and I just want to say on a broader scope, we're very lucky to have you know, three new storefronts yeah. uh, taken up that were previously empty. And uh, so I think it speaks volumes to the town, and uh, we're, thank you very much for choosing here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So on the motion by Ms. Mah oh, anybody wishing here, anybody wishing to speak on yummies? Yummies for the tummies. All right. On the motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Byrne. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, good luck. Thank you for choosing, for Thank being so in Arlington and now choosing to yep. put in a new storefront. Thank you. Thank Best you. of luck. Uh, traffic rules and orders, number five, a request residential handicap parking at 120 Varnum Street. Yes. Hi, my name is Victor Cavallo. I'm in Petit for 26 years. And uh, lately I've been having a tough time walking. And also, I'm, uh, I have ulcerated ankle on the right leg. So I have to use the crutches to walk up and down the stairs. That's why I came to you people to uh, have the park outside the door. Okay. I will say that I did drive by I'm down there all the time anyways, the residents, and um, everything looked appropriate to me. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to make a motion. Okay, Mr. Dunn, um, then I'll, Mr. Carroll. I'll, I'll move approval. I just want to note that we've got uh, letters from uh, the fire department and the police department uh, with support, and that is certainly, and it, it appears to meet the criteria for all those reasons. Uh, I make the support get the motion, or make the motion, excuse me. Okay, Mr. Carroll. I, I just wanted to point out, and I'm sure, I'm sure the police department explained this to you that, that uh, although the application is for a handicapped parking spot in that location, if there were to be another driver to come when you, when you were not there, it, yes, it's I not understand. actually a dedicated spot, but. I understand. And, and there are also considerations during snowstorms, which. Right. We should all be thinking about tonight, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, we just okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. Who made the motion? I did. Mr. Dunn, seconded by second. Mr. Curo. Further discussion. All those in favor, please signify, signify by saying aye. 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 All those aye. opposed. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you. I'm having my own trouble walking. I know what you're talking about. 
Uh, uh, item number six, a letter concerning Belmont Upland Silver Maple Forest. Mr. Curo. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'm going to uh, ask that we uh, table this, this matter indefinitely. Um, new information has come to light, and, and I believe it may not be timely anymore. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, that which we are all tingling with excitement about, we now move into the warrant article hearings. We will start with the special town meeting articles and then go back to the regular because that's the way they will be handled at uh, town meeting as well. So the first one, special town meeting, Article 2, bylaw amendment, leaf blowers. I assume we should start with you, Mrs. Mahan, a report yes. from your committee. Very briefly. Um, the committee met many times, had a public hearing. Um, myself and Mr. Greeley served on the committee. Myself as a voting member, Mr. Greeley is ex officio. Um, the committee met close to half a dozen times, not counting everything that we had to do by email. There was a <clears> lot of um, energy and expertise, and people really went out and did their homework. And, um, the Leaf Blower Committee, we're not done yet, but really is to be commended because we really got our hands around an issue um, that set off a lot of strong opinions on both sides. Uh, we, the committee had planned, we had done everything early in case we needed a second public hearing, but we had the first public hearing, Mr. Greeley moderated that. Everyone who came to the microphone had a, an opportunity to speak. We, in fact, ended a little bit earlier. I had anticipated would go the max and maybe have to consider a second meeting. And I really take that as a testament to my colleagues on the leaf blower committee for really working on this. Um, I'm not going to go through the document piece by piece because <laughs> it's been out there. It's on the website. We have it. Um, I'm sure it'll be discussed and maybe amended, maybe not at town meeting. But what we did was we came up with um, restrictions, further fine tunings in terms of hours and square feet per leaf blower and decibel levels and um, really had great expertise on behalf of the landscape contractors who were um, on the committee as well as the residents in the town who were really well versed around environmental issues. Not everybody, this was not 100% agreement on this and I don't think we're ever going to get that. But it's a document what this committee was charged to do, hold a public hearing, take what we had, revise it, and put that back out for the Board of Selectmen to present to town meeting who ultimately will have this decision, will have the decision to make. What's before us are restrictions for um, commercial and municipal uses. And commercial doesn't just mean landscape contractors. There are some other crafts that also use um, leaf blowers. And I, one of the things I really want to point out that I'm proud of that the committee came up with um, is that inherent in here is taking the current technology that they have around decibel le levels and environmental and um, as the landscape contractors pointed out they may replenish their leaf blowers every two to three years whereas a homeowner may buy one and is using it one Saturday maybe four or five times a year so some people may look at this and say gee it's awfully ambitious but it only applies to municipality Arlington and commercial uses which really do use um, that and with that, I do know this is a public hearing that Mr. Greeley will be holding. I know there are some members of the committee here. Not everyone could make it because it's a big committee, but I would say a good two-thirds of them are here, and I'm going to leave it to any of them who want to comment on any facet of this. Right. I mean, as always, the uh, process is board speaks input, and then the board will uh, uh, speak to make a decision at the end. Um, I'd just like to add a couple of points, just a little bit on, on the history of this status quo. Uh, last year, town meeting, uh, voted to, and the people argue over what's the definition here, is it a restriction or a ban? In my opinion, it's a ban, complete no use of leaf blowers from May 15th through October 15th. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, Professional um, Leaf Blowers Association, along with others, called for a special election in the middle of the summer, um, half-day election, if you will, and the, it, it was not enough of a vote to overturn the town meeting Warren article vote on the ban, but the popular, if you look at what the um, uh, results were, 70% uh, voted against the ban, and there were 30% that supported. Uh, so we formed a committee. We believe, or I believe, I should speak for myself, we can either continue the status quo, which is a complete ban or a restriction, no use of leaf blowers from May 15th to October 15th. We can vote that down at this town meeting and just do, just have, have no uh, restrictions. We felt, in my opinion, that what we want to do is try and come up with a compromise. 
not complete no use and not complete use and come up with a series of restrictions. And I believe that's what this committee has done at this point in time and what certainly I will support bringing before town meeting at this point. So that said, any of my other colleagues wish to speak on this at this point? Mr. Carroll? I, I have a, just a few things that I wanted to point out. I want to just um, highlight a couple points here that it's still not quite sitting well with me. First, I want to thank the committee because I know how much work you put in and I know what a torturous process this, is, this has been. Continues to be and probably continue, will continue to be uh, moving into town, town meeting. I, I think as we move forward in this, um, I think we're all striving probably for three things, I would think. The, the first is simplicity. I mean, this, this should be as simple as remembering what day to put your trash out, pretty much. You're um, kidding, right? Yeah. <laughs> And, and I think we have to ask ourselves the question whether we've achieved, achieved that. Enforceability, I mean, is it, is it realistic? Is it something we can realistically uh, enforce? And the third, which is the one that we'll debate for years to come, is um, kind of fidelity to the uh, will of town meeting, to the, uh, the committee's analysis, to our analysis, to the will of the voters in the referendum, what the referendum meant. That's, that's one that I think we can debate for a long time. Um, I just want to put out just a few things that just I, I have questions about, and, and maybe as some of the committee members get up, the, the, you know, you can address these. Um, firstly, in, in terms of um, in, enforceability, I actually re I really appreciate the sentiments in in um, in 2C, which talks about um, blowers not being able to be used more than 30 minutes at a time with a downtime of 15 minutes. I think that that the spirit there is really well placed in trying to you know, create some room for peace. I'm not sure that that's really an enforceable, um, an enforceable provision. So I'd, I'd be curious what the thought process was on that. So that, that, that's, um, that's one. Um, very much appreciate um, in section five, the, the, um, the provision around uh, using the newer equipment as it, as it rolls, rolls into play. I do worry about conflicts if an officer or, or health, health department um, representative is, is called on a complaint, is there going to be a lot of finger pointing like this? Yes, it complies. No, it doesn't. And, and I, I did question whether there wasn't a way to just simply identify the equipment either through a seal from the, the you know, weights and measures or whatnot so that there's no dispute a actually to assist the, um, the, the contractors to identify, yes, this is, this is all, all cleared. Um, I talked a little bit with the health department. I think we have some resource constraints around something like that, but I didn't know if that had been considered. Um, <clears throat> and just the third question um, c concerns the hours and the days, which I, I suspect is going to be a place where we're going to hear a lot of back and forth at, at, at town meeting. Um, the uh, hours of operation here are through 5.30 p.m., and, and I appreciate that that's an attempt to, to, to keep the, the evenings peaceful. I think most of us were at the hearing, though, and we did hear that there was a concern from some residents who, when they come home from work, you know, if they're not, if they work on the weekend, for example, and they want to be able to work on their, their yards, are they going to be able to do that during, during the summer if, with that cutoff? The rest of the noise abatement bylaw cuts off at, at, at 8. The flip side is we have one day that's really downtime, that's, that's a quiet time here, and I, I just question the, the reasoning there. I think we heard from a lot of people at the hearing, um, even folks who had voted against the, the restriction the past town meeting, that, that um, they were um, looking for a compromise, and I just question the thought process there, whether that was felt that there really, I see there are really three, three constituencies that we're looking, a lot of them overlap too. We have really um, commercial uh, operators who really need to be able to operate their businesses in, in their customers as well. We have um, <clears throat> residents who either work out of the home during the day and are there during the day. And then the third constituency are, um, are other residents who maybe work out of town and need to be able to, to perform their maintenance. And so those are just questions I, I, I put out there that just things that highlight it. I think mo overall, I'm really happy with the, with the draft that's here, but I just question the thought process as to how the enforceability and, and how the, the, the constituencies are balanced. Can I answer those just briefly? The, the first question, <clears throat> the search for a simple document yeah. doesn't exist. 
The, the simple document was before. There were no restrictions, and yeah. now we've defined it. The second regarding enforcement, um, Jim Feeney from the Board of Health yeah. came to several of our meetings. Um, he likened it to the way we enforce, like during snowstorms, when the um, snow plow contractors usually, never has it been Arlington businesses, but from you know other cities and towns come in and they start throwing the uh, snow in the street, yeah. and or sometimes a resident. When they call the non-emergency number, the police car is up there within two, three minutes. I saw it happen on my street during that big, huge storm. Um, one of my neighbors had called me, so I placed a call, and they literally left there two, three minutes. And in the beginning, it's a little bit of a, you know, kind of heavily used. Um, I know when the uh, town meeting passed the initial restriction um, before the vote, uh, they told me 8, 12 a.m. that Saturday morning residents were calling so the residents already knew out there to the jet you coming home or my husband coming home after 5 30 at night this doesn't apply to you this only applies to commercial and municipal um, what what applies to you as a resident a homeowner is the current noise abatement law and and it's um, if you want I'll tell you exactly it's I highlighted for you under section 2 J at the very end, it says, other than leaf blowers used on private property, and then also in the preamble, it says that these restrictions apply to municipal and commercial uses only. So that gets to your, when you come home, you're not abiding by the, the 530. And then um, the only other thing I would say is in terms of um, can we tweak this a little bit? Yes, we can. Um, but I think it's a good working document. When the special town meeting was called for by the uh, gentleman from Precinct 13, gotcha. Town meeting said no. We don't want to take any action. Yeah. We want this committee to be formed and come back with a working document. So we're bound that we have to come back with something. Yeah. Um, so I hope that answers your questions. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for uh, pointing out D1. I hadn't. I hadn't tied the two. Tied the two together. And I should have presented it better. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, I would just add on. You know, enforceability on this is like um, not allowed to throw snow on the street. With the yeah. snowblower. Well, how's that enforced? I mean, and have we ever seen anybody throwing their snow on the street? So I believe what will happen here is, you know, should this be approved by town meeting, first and foremost, I expect a number of amendments to things you've talked about. Yeah. I don't want the timing then. I want to allow it here or, or whatever. Um, uh, but uh, it's got to be up to neighbors, I believe, and it's up to the Board of Health to enforce um, uh, when, when they're called by a neighbor or something like that. We obviously don't have the manpower to send, right. have every street of the 5.5 square miles, you know, have routes taken or the police trained in leaf blower uh, dissemination or lack thereof or whatever the case may be. So wait, anything else from my colleagues first? I'm ready to, oh. Okay, who'd like to speak on this, please? Yes. Yep. Well, um, Carol Band. Mm -hmm town meeting member, Precinct 8. We talk about simplicity and the very nature of simplicity is the partial ban on the seasonal restriction on gas-powered leaf blowers, which is in place in Brookline and has been operating to no ill effect for several years now. Um, and, uh, and, and town meeting has already voted once to <coughs> uphold the seasonal ban the special election, which cost the town money, upheld the seasonal ban. Then there was another special town meeting, which upheld the seasonal ban. And now we're bringing it again, we're dragging it again in front of town meeting. We've crafted, we've squeezed out this compromise, which is not a compromise, to again show it in front of town meeting. And why don't we just see how it works? It's been passed three times. Let it go to the town and see how it works for a year. If it doesn't work, we'll bring it, look at it again, but check it out. It's working in Brookline. It's working in other communities around the state and around the country with no ill effects to landscapers or homeowners. There you have it. I think that we're undermining democracy and we're, and we're, we're second guessing town meeting members and, and not giving them credit. Just to that point, we're bringing it to town meeting for the yes. vote, Carol, so we're not disrespecting Well, I know Thank we you. are, but they've Thank already you. voted on it Thank twice. You. Thank you. Now we're putting a compromise in front of them to vote on. Who else would like to speak on this? Yes, please. Whoever, come on. Oh, you're right there. Jimmy, sorry, come forward. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, you're right there. Okay. Please. Hi, I'm Cheryl Miller on Thesda Street. 
Um, first, I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss something in the, the document. Um, so there's no provision as to how, like, the proximity to. Carol, please. There's no provision as to the proximity of, to bystanders that someone can use a leaf blower. Is that correct in, in the document? I went through it, but, you know, it was pretty detailed, so. Um, you mean we put in there that with like you can't use one closer feet? to closer to so and closer to you know a property line or to a person or something you can't use one within you know 25 feet of a playground or something along no, those lines. No, that's line? not in there. Okay. A person. In that, in that case, I would like you to vote no action on this because I don't think it's adequate to protect people from uh, the realities of leaf blowers. I, I certainly understand the desire to have a compromise at this point and to be done with this issue. I'm I, I'm sure you all wish to be done with this issue. But this doesn't solve all the problems that leaf blowers cause. And, um, I think I said in the public hearing that um, leaf blowers, in their own manuals, say that bystanders should not be closer than 50 feet to the, to the leaf blower and that operators should be wearing protective equipment. But right now, in this compromise, as I understand it, some, I could be walking down the street with my kids and I could be on the sidewalk and uh, someone could come up two feet away from me and start up a leaf blower. And in that, I mean, would you not say that we should be wearing protective equipment at that distance? I mean, it, it seems to me pretty clear that we ought to be. And yet there's no protection, there's nothing to stop people from doing that. And I have been standing in the street with my kids waiting for someone to be finished because I could not go closer. I, I didn't feel it was safe for me to go closer. And it's absolutely impossible to get the attention of someone who's using leaf blowers short of throwing something at them because they, they can't hear you. So. That seems like a very fundamental protection that should be part of this agreement. Mm -hmm. And since it's not, I would suggest that you please either add it in if you have that ability to do so, or to vote no action on this compromise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, technically it is in, uh, people are not allowed to blow things onto sidewalks or whatever. So in other words, they would have to be blowing it towards the property. But your point is well taken. I mean, there's also the noise of it and the, the fumes of it, All which right. are, you know, Nothing, nothing protects us from that if we're that close. But I just want to, they're not allowed to blow it on the sidewalk. Well, are they allowed to stand? Any time, never mind when you're walking by. A lot of people stand, the, the operators stand in the road and blow back toward the, the, um, the, the house. Is that going to be prohibited as well? Well, no, it is to blow it towards the house. That's what they have to do. Right, That's if they're I'm standing in the road, then the road is de, is de facto not useful, the, or at least part of it. If you, depending right. on how, yeah. how, how realistic you think this 50 feet or whatever it is, there is a zone during which in which people should not be without protective equipment. Right. And this d does not address that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yep. Mr. Tibbetts. I'm Gary Tibbetts from uh, Precinct 5, and I was a member of the uh, Leaf Blower Committee. And I'd just like to point out to the selectmen, uh, the committee was comprised of four people that were definitely against leaf blowers, four contractors that were for it, and four citizens just that volunteered to be on the committee. Um, our results that we came up with, they weren't unanimous, but they were voted on by the majority of us, and that's how we came up with them. Um, our results mirrored closely the um, public comment meeting that we had. Uh, the public comments mirrored the results of the special election, uh, where about three to one people are either for no ban or for this compromise. And uh, I think that's important to point out. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, as far as operating them, common sense has to be used. And the woman before me had some points, but common sense tells you you're not going to blow something at somebody walking by. And, you know, us as professionals, not, you know, not that that's a big profession, but it's what we do all the time. We watch out for that and, you know, we pay attention to it. So, um, you know, I, I really think this is a compromise. The people spoke in the election. The, the, you know, the people that got involved in this committee and in the public comments spoke, and they all, they all said the same thing. We don't want this ban, these tight restrictions. We want this compromise. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tibbetts. Yep. Joe, one second. I call, go ahead. You were coming up. Yep. Come on. Huh? No, no. You come up. I, let me run this thing, okay? <laughs> I saw you next, so you're next. Okay. So I'm a member of the committee also, and I know these things get long-winded, and I want it to be very clear. So I'm going to read this. It's one page, double-spaced. So my name is George Adelman, and I'm a member of the committee also. 
I'm one of the citizen members, so I think it's important to know. I think I represent a lot of people who are sort of tired of this. <laughs> I joined the committee because I thought the town was spending way too much of its resources on this. I was especially annoyed at the $30,000 spent for the special vote. It's like the town's got more things to do with its money than that. I personally hoped I could contribute to the closure of this issue because I have an engineering background, I have a legal background, and I work in medical equipment for the last 40 years. So I learned six things being on this committee, and I'd like to relate those six things to you. Um, as Mr. Greeley already said, there was a warrant for a complete ban, which was changed to a summer ban, which was enacted and upheld in special town vote. And there was a lot of talk about was that vote for or against, even though technically it supported the ban. I don't know, but I know that. It seems to me it's unclear that there are serious medical effects from leaf blower use. There are lots of other things that cause more, more problems than that, except to the operators. And um, they have their employers to deal with that. It is clear to me, and I think to most anybody, that leaf blowers are noisy. However, the, I learned in this committee <coughs> that the leaf blower industry is working on developing quiet leaf blowers. And in fact, they already have. They're available from at least four companies I saw. And with a leaf blower that's 65 dBA at 50 feet, that means that if you and I are talking here, we can hear each other <coughs> even though a leaf blower is going 65 feet away. So I, um, I learned that, and I also learned that during the summer months, leaf blowers are not used to blow leaves. It wasn't obvious at first, but because they're leaf blowers, but they're actually used to clean up yards, and people have windows open, and the same leaf blowers, as loud as they are for blowing lots of leaves are used for this cleanup. And usually in the summer, it takes 30 minutes or less to do this. However, the leaf blowers are still loud. They're the same leaf blowers. Now, I was particularly frustrated at this meeting. Uh, the committee, committee overwhelmingly, in my opinion, consists of people who are against the ban. I really believe that. I came in either way. I was willing to say, let's just get rid of this because it's a waste of time. But I wanted to listen to all the input. I went to all the meetings. I went to the hearing. So I believe that this alternative you're being proposed is actually a repeal of the ban. It really doesn't, it's unenforceable. There's no way anybody can complain about it. There's no way to tell. Is this leaf blower on for 15 minutes, 30 minutes? It's, it's just crazy from my perspective. So I've learned in business, you never say it's bad unless you have an alternative. And I learned something really powerful that the motivation for the uh, landscapers is financial, that they want to be able to do their job. And they also believe, and I've learned, that in the next three, four years, leaf blowers are going to be quieter. But right now, we have people worried about the loudness of leaf blowers. So I have a proposal. One, which is already in the rule, as I understand it, that's being proposed, is residents can use leaf blowers. Themselves can use leaf blowers on their own property, anytime within the realm of the, the present laws. And the other is that the landscapers can use a leaf blower any time during the summer and, frankly, any time during the year, whatever hours are legitimate now, before the ban, if the leaf blower is labeled 65 dB or less. They can buy them. That's a real burden on them. They have to buy them now. But they plan on buying them anyway. They really do. That's what I've said, I've heard. 
This will all go away in three years. But I'll be three years older in three years. <laughs> and I'd rather be hear the quiet now. And just as a point, in order to enforce this, leaf blower manufacturers put on a label that says 65 dB. And in fact, as I said before, if you're 50 feet away and I can talk to you, then it's 65 dB or less. If I can't talk to you, it's way louder. And I believe that the way you would enforce it is um, you can ask, if you think it's too loud, you go ask to see the label. And this is only during the summer. We're not talking about when there's lots of leaves to blow. It's really hard to clean up yards with lots of leaves without a leaf blower. And they can use the quiet ones then too. And if you find someone that has a loud one and they won't show you the label, take the number down in their truck. I learned that trucks have to have pretty big letters with their phone number and address on it. Take it down, call the police. If the police get a couple calls, they go find, they call a the number. They, they help be proactive about it. So I think this is much more manageable, much simpler than certain hours, certain days. It's a little more of a compromise than what's enacted now, but it is doable, and I think it actually gives an out to everybody. That's yeah. my two cents. Thank you. Yep. Hi, I'm Bill Downing. Uh, I was a member of the Leaf Blower Committee. Um, I agree with what George said, a lot of what he said. I came here to tell you that uh, the machines are getting uh, quieter and cleaner, okay? Uh, the EPA has put restrictions on them, and uh, they met those restrictions 2012. So the new machines that we're buying, the emissions are much cleaner. Uh, the decibels are coming down. A way to check decibels, if the police were to show up or the uh, Board of Health were to show up, uh, if it's not on the machine, there's an owner's manual that, lay, that has the decibel level, and maybe you carry that in the glove box of the truck yeah. or a copy of it in the glove box of the truck and you, <coughs> yeah, this machine meets the decibel level. Yeah. Uh, Carol alluded to a Brookline ban, which was voted in a while back, but they haven't enforced it yet. They haven't started it yet, okay? So it's not happening in Brookline at this point, okay? Or if it has, it was just after the summer. It's possible uh, it went in September or October, um, but uh, it, it, it hasn't been established in Brookline, although they voted it. Um, what we're asking for is work with us and not hurt us, not put us out of business. I think that local government should, should work with business uh, to help them go along and get along while we're trying to work with the manufacturers to give us better machines so that you know, we're not bothering people. We're not out to bother people. Uh, I think the one was from Chester Street. We talked about this. I know that all my guys and all the guys that on the, on the board with me when anybody's walking by, especially children, you shut the machine down. And you just even go do something else or just wait. And maybe that's part of the training that we can do, okay? And, and have it available even for, for other people, uh, homeowners, if they'd like to attend training, okay? That the landscapers need to train their personnel that if there's somebody, anybody trying to walk by, and you get the attention, you know, and you might have to wave. If you just walk with your head down and walk by a leaf ball, yeah, you might get something blown at you. But if you catch, make eye contact, that machine should be shut down and you should be able to walk by, you know, unfettered. Well, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question? Mr. Yes. Sure. Yeah, I was just, I was just wondering, um, Mr. Was it Edelman? Edelman. Yeah, yeah I had mentioned, I talked about 65 dBA, and I see that the recommendation here is, is for 74 dBA target. Can that, I that that's where the, that? the equipment is um, The landscape um, contractors are really turning over their um, equipment at a rapid rate. So is the town, but the town, the town of Arlington, uh, through DPW, are also involved in this. And what we said was we started initially with the 75 
give everybody two years. It'll probably take us longer in terms of our capital expense. For yeah. the town of Arlington to go out right away next month, yeah. six months, right, right. allow the town, um, so this was a, not just the landscape contractors, yeah. it was also what's gonna work for the town of Arlington, because it would be ill-advised for us to say to the town of Arlington, unless they said that they were prepared and they're not. Everybody agreed that by um, the beginning of the 2015 cycle, <clears throat> the landscape contractors will be at, at the 64, right. and the town should be at the 64, but we really have to be cognizant of the budget and what's been put in place. We can't give on the, so that's more for, they're already there probably by the end of this season, it's summer, fall. It's gonna give us the time so that we can appropriate the monies too. Not that we're not going to replace them, but we, they replace theirs faster than the town mm -hmm. of Arlington does. And I don't know if you wanna to add to that, Mr. Downing. Well, we go through machines in a year or two, so we're, we're constantly upgrading our equipment, so we're, we're buying the latest state-of-the-art that comes out. So when the new machines, and they tell me it's two years, I can't tell you it's two years, maybe three. That yeah. There's gonna be a commercial unit that, that we can work with uh, that'll give us the power, uh, it'll meet the emissions of the EPA, uh, that'll be 65 decibels or less. And, and that's where I think the solution is. I think when, the, when those models come out, uh, leaf blowing issue will, will, won't exist anymore. Does, does that answer that question? Yeah, it does. And the it first question meant by Mr. Edelman, it is in there for the homeowners, um, and, and, and he acknowledged that also. So I think we've covered that. I just want to make sure everybody, everything on the table. Also, for those homeowner models that don't get replaced, um, they're talking about a buyback program to get those out of circulation as well, yeah. the manufacturers. Now, that would be good to see. So, thank thank you, you very much. Sorry I called you Joe Schumann. Can I make a motion of favorable action if there's nobody else? Yes, you can. So it's a motion for favorable action, but we still, no, no, we have others to speak, please. No, no. we can do town. Yes. Oh, I didn't know there was someone else, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Christian Klein, from pre I'm a town meeting member of Precinct 10. Um, I just wanted to just ask a question on the enforcement side of things again. This is all still maintained within the noise abatement as it stands today in the noise abatement um, article of the town bylaws, is that correct? This will be appended on to it. be a part of it. it. So the existing enforcement provisions of the noise abatement will remain in effect for this, which is a written notice for first offense and $200 per occurrence thereafter? Yes. Okay. Um, when this came up before town meeting, I had spoken with the chief of police and asked him what his department would do if somebody came forward with a complaint about an excess noise. And he's like, well, I would send them to the Board of Health because we don't have the equipment to determine what the noise levels are. And I went to the Board of Health and said, you have the equipment, what would you do? And they said, well, we would send out one of our inspectors, but we typically don't have inspectors available, so it might take a couple of days and we got into this discussion that the noise abatement article as it's written currently is very effective if you have a construction site that has you know somebody running a jackhammer that is back you know time and time again in a pretty consolidated period of time and it allows them to address things on that sort of a time scale but when i asked specifically about you know what do you do with a company that's there for a couple of hours and then is gone for a week or two and they didn't really have an answer for how they could address those kinds of issues. And so I think it would be uh, very helpful for the discussion as it comes into town meeting if there was a very specific process in mind as to how this is going to be enforced at the town level, as to who's supposed to be contacting, who's gonna be controlling it, because the sense I've gotten so far talking with the various town boards is it's, well, it's their problem, it's their problem, it's not quite us, it's, you know. So I think, I think it would help the whole argument and the whole discussion in general if we had a, a set idea as to how we're gonna be handling the enforcement when it comes forward. Yeah, I just uh, want so uh, I think and I just want to make sure I understand mm -hmm. what you're your concern. So I agree that enforcement is something we have to talk about and think about. Uh, but there's no equipment that you need to enforce this one. No, and I think okay. that originally I think some of the earlier ones it was like, you know saying we have like a 75 and it's exactly, like oh, how do you yeah. you know so, so there's that to, so, portion of it exactly. Okay. So I agree enforcement is an issue, but equipment is uh, enforcement equipment isn't exactly right? like okay. where we're right. now where I think it's based mostly on clock time and okay. things like that. I think it's a much easier one to enforce. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Can can I just speak to that? We had this um, discussion, and it may just be words, and I don't want to say semantics that has a negative connotation. But when we had the um, snow shoveling bylaw. And can this be enforced? No. And what the question was, can the Board of Health and Arlington Police constantly patrol the streets 
to make sure and knock on residents' doors and knock on business owners' doors. No, they can't. Similar to noise abatement. When that went in, a lot of people said, well, how are you going to, Board of Health, can you do this? Chief, um, Chief of Police, can you do this? No, we can't. We can't go out and be proactive. But what we do is we're reactive. So this would be similar to if um, when people report a business hasn't shoveled. You know, you give them an example. What happens is as those calls come into the non-emergency line, they come through the, actually, they don't go non-emergency. They go through the um, town question answer. But some people still do call that non-emergency line. They get, get dispatched. They get plugged into the system that we have online. And what happens is when an officer is available or if Board of Health is available, they go out. Sometimes it may not even be for snow shoveling. For this, they would go out and they have a copy of the bylaw. They go to the resident. They go to the business. They go to the person company plowing in the street. So it's sort of semantics. Can we enforce this? No. But can we be reactively enforcing this? Yes. But, as best we can. But my understanding, the enforcement comes under the Board of Health, period, on this. Is that correct, Mr. Chaplain? <coughs> well, the noise abatement law does, but certainly police or Board of Health inspectors could issue a violation. Okay. Anybody else who hasn't spoken wishing to speak on this? Okay, you wanted one question or something? You have to come to the mic. Hi, my question was, I've heard that the decibel levels um, tossed out there, but is that at the machine or is that at 50 feet? It's at 50 feet. Yeah. Okay, so if someone is using a leaf blower in their backyard and the person next is, you know, 10 feet away, then the noise is going to be considerably louder. Like, you know, someone's kids are playing in the, in the yard next door. Right. So, okay. 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 Just to clear up the enforcement, all of our trucks by law in Massachusetts have to be leaded with our name and our phone number on them. And if there is a complaint called in, that man had a good point. You know, the, the landscape is gone in 10 or 15 minutes. But they can check with the homeowner, the home they were working, see what landscaper was working there. Or the person that's calling it in can have the landscaper's name and phone number, and the police can visit their shop later. That's all under the law now. The trucks have to be leaded. So... And all our guys, you know, wear jackets with our names on them and everything else. So it's, it's pretty, pretty clear who's doing what. Thank you. Did you want to ask him a question? No, oh. I don't want to. Okay. All right, uh, members of the board. Uh, so uh, Ms. Mahan uh, moved favorable action. Is there a second? Second. Okay, now discussion. Okay, Stephen, I saw others. I don't care. Um, okay, I'll, I'll leave it up then. Thanks. Um, I, a couple things. One, I, like, uh, I very much like George's, I'm sorry, I forget your last name, your ideas. Um, and I, th I think it's promising to see that in a couple of years, this will not be an issue. I think that's, you know, a weight off all our backs. Um, now for the next, until that time comes, we do have to, you know, deal with this issue. And I, I will support, um, I will support this compromise. And I do really like, um, Bill's idea of training. I think that, you know, if with further training, we'll be more educated users of leaf blowers. Um, and that, and that's, um, that's better for everyone in town. I think that neighbors will, you know, appreciate that. And with the, you know, I, it came up earlier that we're in a very dense, um, dense area. And, you know, we can't be 50 feet away from our neighbor's property at all times. Um, that and that's just you know that's part of living in Arlington. I think that's something that a lot of people have come to enjoy about living in Arlington. Um, so there, you know, it w does come down to a respect factor, and we might not be able to enforce everything, but we will, you know, do our best to. And I think that if we do, um, you know, this. I'm sure at town meeting it will be an interesting discussion. But I, um, I'm comfortable with moving forward with these um, compromises. And I'm sorry that we cannot keep you know, everyone happy, but that's, um, I guess, part of being on the Board of Selectmen. And so I'd like to thank the Leaf Oil Committee for all their work. And um, um, thank you for this outcome and bringing this to us. Uh, so you started this conversation talking about uh, give, giving us a little history on the issue. And I would actually go back a little bit farther in history and say a year ago, uh, three of us were on the board, two of us weren't. A year ago, we had two public hearings on the leaf blower issue on an article. 
and we had zero attendees. We had not a single person show up for two public hearings about leaf blowers. And I say, what a difference a year makes. <laughs> um, so town meeting chose to pass uh, the seasonal ban. And then uh, there was an unprecedented reaction from the people of the town. And uh, I, voted to, I voted against the ban as a selectman. I voted against the ban as a town meeting member. Um, but I but at the same time, what I th but then what happened after that, you know, made me think about it and reconsider uh, further. So I, I guess I, uh, what we promised people at that point was that we would create a compromise committee and that committee would investigate and c try to come up with a better solution. And uh, we promised that in taught when we, before the special vote, we promised that before the special town meeting. I stood up in front of a special town meeting and I represented the board of selectmen and I said, this is our, we're asking for a compromise committee and let's wait till that comes back and we promised we're gonna talk about this next year. And I look at this work this committee did and I said, we fulfilled that promise um, and I'm happy with the recommendation as it sees fit. Is, would I, re, would I, if I was like, you know, dictator of Arlington, would I take a large, you know, red pen and like slice it up in 15 different ways? I absolutely would, but I think that this is the right compromise and I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Mr. Kiro. Thank, thank you very much. I, I think I've been open that, uh, unlike my colleagues at that town meeting, I did support the, um, the uh, seasonal rest restriction. Um, but I would uh, point out that during the special town meeting, although town meeting voted again to uphold the seasonal restriction, they also voted to, to, con to constitute this committee. And I actually feel we have an obligation to, to pass this back through to town meeting for them to uh, pass off on it. So I will be supporting the motion. As a town meeting member, depending on what kind of amendments come forward, you know, I, I, I will have to reserve my rights to represent my, my precinct in the interest of the town. But, but I think that we do have an obligation to, to pass this back to town meeting and, and uh, let them uh, pass on it. That was, uh, I think, part of what we, as Dan said, part of what we promised and part of what we put forward in, in the fall. Okay. After the vote, if I could just say something briefly after. Okay. <clears throat> so on the vote, recommending favorable action on the report by the committee and making those bylaw amendments. All those uh, moved by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Dunn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote, believe, right? Yeah. Yes, Mr. And, and just very briefly, I do want to point out and thank, um, honestly, sometimes people might think you say this because you have to, but I want to thank the Board of Selectmen Office, um, Mrs. Sullivan, Mary Ann, Mrs. Kropelka, Marie, and Ms. Re Mrs. Reedy, Fran Reedy. This really became like another job for them and for myself. I lost a client because I wasn't getting work in on time. And the reason I put that forth is I see other um, proposals coming currently and in future years. And I began to have a conversation with the town manager and with the town moderator that <clears throat> on these hot ticket items, I'm not talking about this, this really was a job for me. I mean, you guys got three, I mean, everybody got $3,000 if not more. Um, in the future, if we could sort of set up some process, and it really dragged the select, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but a lot of stuff went asunder. You know, we have elections and special elections and everything else that we have to do. It really took some wear and tear on us. So as we go forward on this, if we could maybe, and I don't know what that process is. I have some ideas, and I'll, I'm going to leave it to Mr. Leone and Mr. Chapdelaine with some of my suggestions. Maybe in the future, if this type of committee gets formed again, A, I'm not on it. And B, um, we, uh, we kind of talk about that because I'm not saying it, it isn't through the resources of the selectman's office, and I'm not exaggerating. I know I get really passionate and overpassionate about some things, but it really was, um, took a substantial hit to the day-to-day -to -day workings of the selectman's office for just a little microcosm of time. So just to the, my colleagues, but really thank you. They put in so much work um, similar to the members of the committee on both sides of the issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is next will be Article 4 of the Special Town Meeting Bylaw Amendment, the sale of drinking water in single-serve pet Hold bottles. It. Please. Hi, my name is Amy Curl. I am from Precinct 13, and I live at 9 Langley Road. Welcome. Uh, I would very much like to thank the Board of Selectmen for hearing me speak about this issue tonight and everyone who came here to support us. We do have quite a few people here. Um, I'm not alone working on this. I've worked on this with Marina Milan and Sonia Zacker who are standing up here with me. Um, but my birthday happened to fall first on the calendar year, so my name is on it. Um, and I'm also the president of Arlington High School's Environmental Club, so I've kind of 
been the leader. Um, so as you know, article number four is the warrant article to ban the sale of non-sparkling, unflavored drinking water, water in single-serving PET bottles that are one liter or less in the town of Arlington. And we uh, have given packets to the board and um, some of you over here with some more facts and just a little deeper explanation of what we are trying to accomplish and <clears throat> sorry, some of the research that we've done, but I will try to be brief with my comments. Um, so we have been working for a couple of years to educate at least the student body at Arlington High on water bottle use for years and they've been incredibly receptive and we've seen it at the high school. However, it's not enough to just educate our students of Arlington. We are looking to encourage the entire town to be more environmentally friendly. And we hope this ban will encourage environmentally conscious behavior and educate the people of this town to make some more informed decisions. A little change goes a long way and I have a couple of uh, facts that we've done from some research that I would just like to point out. So the tap water in Arlington, according to the MWRA, through some of their research, is actually some of the cleanest water in the country, uh, not just the state. And many major bottled water companies, such as Aquafina famously, simply sell bottled water, uh, bottled tap water, and pass it off as their own product. So it's not much different than what we get out of the sink. And bottled water is not only harmful for when the bottles end up in landfills and aren't properly recycled, but also the way that they're produced in the first place. The production and transportation of said bottled water releases uh, tons of unnecessary fossil fuels into the environment. These bottles are also stored for months at a time before they're actually consumed, and many chemicals from the bottles, because the PET is not very strong plastic, some of the chemicals from the PET will seep into the water, um, and this happens very often over time. They can have uh, some dangerous effects. For example, BPA can mimic the effect of estrogen in a person if it's consumed enough over time. And tap water in Arlington is usually more clean than bottled water because tap water is regulated by the EPA and bottled water is regulated by the FDA. And each have their own standards, but the FDA allows small levels of certain chemicals to be in approved bottled water. And it is better for the environment, an individual's health, and for each person's wallet to simply buy a reusable water bottle and fill it up time and time again. Many of them last for years and years. With this proposal, we plan to encourage people in the town to use reusable water bottles, which saves money and resources. Um, we've also wanted to address some concerns that we've heard from the people. We've read some of the comments, and we've had people come up and talk to us, and we are very much listening to what people say, and we know that there are a lot of things about this issue that are controversial. So we are specifically, we want to address first, um, people keep asking us why we're banning water and not soda. And because water comes free from the tap and thus forth it's an unnecessary expense. And they both have effects on a person's health. Um, soda contains processed sugar, but then bottled water can also can, contain dangerous chemicals that a person will consume. In addition, Arlington students were found to have the least amount of excessive body weight by the uh, Department of Public Health in a study done a couple of years ago. And, um, this was in the news. And so if our Arlington students are being raised to make smart decisions, we have a lot of faith in our Arlington residents um, that they will be able to make smart decisions when it comes to their beverage consumptions. And uh, buying soda should not be the natural alternative to buying bottled water. Carrying a reusable water bottle should be the natural alternative to buying bottled water. And we think that Arlington residents um, will naturally make this decision. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so we... Another concern is that people don't like the idea of the government controlling their day-to-day -day choices. And this proposal isn't about taking away people's liberties or their freedom to choose, but it's really about saving the planet and working towards a bigger future. This uh, removing bottled water, this is a very small task to do, but it will have a big payoff when it comes to the environment and our planet's future. And we are hoping that this ban will show Arlington how we can do better and uh, what we can do to help the environment. And another, the last concern uh, is fiscally. And the Arlington Chamber of Commerce did a study between 59 business owners in Arlington and 53 of them voted that they didn't think this would have an effect on their business. Um, so in terms of Arlington business owners, they do not, those 53 are not concerned that this will really have too much of a detrimental impact on their business. And the town wouldn't have to spend any money for this, maybe except to have someone monitor as an extra portion of their job, but they wouldn't be losing any money from having this ban into place. So we thank you very much for listening to us. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Amy, mm -hmm. yeah, um, I actually think you were in my group last career day or something. I you? was, yeah. yep. I think um, I judged her in a math, in a math uh, um, did you do the math fair? 
um, a couple of years ago, sophomore year it was, so two years ago. They use you as a judge in that? They do. <laughs> <laughs> Almost as ridiculous as using me for the career day, but. <laughs> you, were, you were very effective. You were a great speaker. I ended up interning with Sean Garbley that summer for about four weeks, so it was a very effective career day. Sean is with us tonight. We certainly uh, always appreciate his presence here in the chamber. Um, I, I want to thank you. I think it's mm -hmm. outstanding that you're getting involved like this and that you have the courage to do this and thank that you. I assume you'll be doing the same thing in front of town meeting. Yes. Mm -hmm. But without breaking your heart, I, I don't favor it at this point in time, but mm -hmm. we're going to certainly let everybody speak who would like to at this point. But I, you did a spectacular job. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I do think this is a choice issue and I honestly feel it's better handled on the state level mm -hmm. with the bottle bill expanding to include deposits on such things. However, mm -hmm. uh, it's tough to debate against you. You did an excellent job in terms of that case you just Thank presented. You. But obviously others would, would like to speak on this issue as well. Okay, uh, Sean, as always, selectmen speak first, then we'll take more of the public input, and then we'll come back to the selectmen. Mr. Byrne. Uh, Amy must be pretty popular, because she's also my neighbor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I've seen her at the high school, can I say that? <laughs> and, uh, no, I'm so impressed by you guys for taking this on, um, you know, trying to improve the town's environment, and, uh, you know, trying even more so to implement change for the town's leg legislative mm -hmm. processes you know, much more than I was doing as a senior in high school, I can assure you that. Um, so there's something to look forward to, as what you can you see. <laughs> um, and, you know, I hope that you do, you know, bring that drive for change to college mm -hmm. and, you know, further on into your career, because I think that, you know, you guys will do a lot of good and continue to do a lot of good. Um, that being said, I also um, second Ke Kevin's um, you know, thoughts, and I, I won't be supporting this at, uh, at this time. Um, you know, I, I think that we should continue to focus on encouraging recycling mm -hmm. and, you know, promoting environmentally friendly businesses and individuals. And, um, you know, I think that's, and I know that's something that you've been doing um, mm -hmm. in the past, and I'm sure it's something you continue to do, and I hope that you continue to do this. I don't want this to be, you know, something that, you know, stops all of your hard work, and I'm sure that it won't be from knowing you for many years. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much for coming in front of us, and that was a phenomenal presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mahan, that's our next. To Ms. Carell, Amy, um, hats off to you. Um, I did a similar thing when I was your age, down at the high school, when I learned about asbestos. I had no idea what that was, mm -hmm. and asked all the construction workers when they. I'm class of '80, so I'm ancient, the dark ages, and I remember asking the workers, "Why are you wearing all those zoot suits and everything?" And they explained asbestos. I had no idea what it was. Investigated it, and I was a AB student, always on the honor roll, volunteered in the office, so you know, always strive to to do the right thing. And I remember going to the principal saying, "Listen, because we were passing through the halls with that. Mm -hmm. This is dangerous stuff." And everybody said, "No, no, no," which is what you're probably going to get here. But I hung on to that and eventually got 30, 40 friends and I told the principal, he said, well, you're going to get suspended. And that meant big time trouble at home with my parents. It, I couldn't even come home with a C. And I organized after sixth period, after lunch, so we took on all our classes. And I had like 30 friends that agreed to walk out with me. By the end of the day, the entire school, including the staff, had walked out. And one of the workers gave me a, a a megaphone and explained why because most of them didn't know so what I'm saying is if you have a what you do you have a solid group of friends mm -hmm. you have a brilliant presentation every time I heard no I kept going forward I became like the queen of the year because we got <laughs> two days off because they had to restructure and get the asbestos work done mm -hmm. so I applaud you on that what I would love to see before me and I'm mm -hmm. gonna get in so much trouble with so many people would be a ban on all plastic plastic mm -hmm bottles of any kind mm -hmm. I would like water to be the last mm -hmm. um, and I understand you know that we can't do that and, and I agree with Kevin maybe on a statewide level I can tell you as a coach at the high school I can tell you when I was a student from 76 to 80 I would not drink out of those water fountains and I can tell you now as a coach even out, especially outside on the field none of my, none of my players I mean at most they splash the water on themselves mm -hmm. so if I would feel comfortable if I felt comfortable I could direct my players and myself to mm -hmm. a suitable water replenishing because you know double sessions mm -hmm. um, and the same thing with Arlington water I have a Brita filter because I have some health issues with all my children no, nothing I'm just saying I'm very right. cognizant of that because right. of my family structure um, so I won't be supporting this mm -hmm. 
But I know you're familiar with the way town meeting works. If, right. if it looks like it's no, you present it again and yep. present it. So you're very well versed on that. Yep. And who knows what you're going to do on town meeting floor? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, just because someone says no now. But right now, I just think in terms of the alternatives, um, again, I wish you, we could ban Pepsi and Gatorade and all that, and I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. But but good job to you may I um, just respond we are I have talked to the class president and we are trying to look into buying um, a installable water filter in the cafeteria that students then could bring reusable water bottles and fill up so we are we have looked into that in the past too and it hasn't worked out because of the funds that Save Club has and the class funds but this year it seems like it might be a possibility so we are looking into that because we do understand that that is something is where well where are we going to fill up our reusable water bottles and we are trying and, to and the work. same thing with the sports i don't know if you want to go to mrs bouvier if you want to whoever the sports entity is mm -hmm. maybe get them plugged in that if you can find a suitable inside source maybe a suitable outside one especially in the summer thank you right. thank you and you want to wait for input or uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy to yeah well i never had the opportunity to judge you <laughs> <laughs> A few, a, a few weeks ago, I did have the opportunity, to, though, to judge a um, debate contest of high school students for the Northeast United States, and I'd mm -hmm. say that you could easily go up against the, uh, the finalists in, in that. <laughs> you, you laid out a great case here this evening. Um, before I say what I think, I wanted to ask a question, though. I mean, mm -hmm. you talked about the high school. Yep. Um, and you mentioned the filter. What else have you done? I mean, have you tried to take steps at the high school to actually institute an across-the-board ban of, of um, disposable water bottles at the high school? We have looked into it, and the school makes not a necessarily, well, I don't want to call it significant. They do make some money off of having the Aquafina machines in the school. They get a portion of it, so they are not necessarily very inclined, especially with the very thin budget that they work with, to get rid of them. We have tried, um, I've tried, the last president has tried, the president before her has tried, and yeah. it's no go. We have worked on reducing other materials in the high school, so we've instituted Drayless Tuesday, so we are working on reducing other materials that we think aren't necessary in the high school. Um, so that, that has been pretty successful, um, not having the styrofoam trays in on Tuesdays. So we, are, we have tried uh, getting rid of the water bottle machines, and we are looking into other things as well. We're kind of an all-encompassing group. Well, let me, so let me string this out just a little bit. The reason I ask is because you, know, you mentioned that, that maybe the solution here would be to, to educate residents in, in Arlington mm -hmm. you know, around not, not purchasing water bottles and using reusable bottles. Right. However, so many of the people who pass through Arlington aren't residents. They're visiting the town. They're coming right. through on the bike path and, and, and such. And for myself, I feel like that's a big burden, and it, sends, it doesn't send the right message to folks who are coming through that, that they have to know. You are now entering Arlington town limits. You know, all water bottles <laughs> do not pass through, through these gates. Um, so I, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I feel like like uh, I think uh, Mr. Greeley said and, and uh, Mr. Dunn, if you start, you're starting, uh, you should start at two places, I would think. It would be one is at the state level on the, the bottle bill. I know Representative Garbley has been very supportive of, mm -hmm. I'm not speaking out of school, am I, Sean? No, I know he's been very supportive of, of, of that. Um, and at the school level, where you really do have a population that you can control. I, I mean, I'd submit that if, if this were, you know, a high enough priority, mm -hmm. if the students weren't buying from those machines, they mm -hmm. wouldn't be making money for the school anymore, and, and you, might, you might well see that you have success there. And I think that would be a pilot that would be very important to have under your belt before trying to exp extend this to the school. I think we've all been reading in the papers about Mayor Bloomberg's little, you know, attempts on the health end of the spectrum down in New York, and they got mm -hmm. shut down in the courts this past week. He, he targeted a specific type of drink, and they, the courts said it was arbitrary and capricious is the ter is the ter capricious is the term so um, I can't support this right now I do really uh, you know like all of my colleagues my hats are off to you for bringing the, the issue forward but I, I would really encourage you to st first start within your school community and see if you can get a successful pilot there where there is a model that works within that community and from there try to see if you can work it to the rest of the school system. And I think you'll have some difficulties, though. When you go throughout the school system, the, 
the PTOs have already been making a lot of changes to offer healthy options, and right. bottled water has been in that mix. So I think that that's, that's part of the place to start. Right, and we've already tried to go through the school to some degree and have not had the success, and we saw that Concord was successful, and we thought, well, why not try here? Arlington's a very welcoming and open town, and they are. we know there's a big environmentally conscious community here, and um, so we have, we will keep trying, thank you, but yes, we, um, this is not our first attempt. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. And good for you, though, seeing what was done in Concord and taking the steps here as you have. Mm -hmm. Do either of you... Two lieutenants want to say anything, you know, to, to get some time on camera? Um, you, you got to come to the microphone. I'm sorry. Say your name again, sorry. My name is Sonia Zacker. Okay, thank um, you. I just wanted to thank the Board of Selectmen for hearing our proposal. Um, okay. My name is Marina Milan, um, and I just want to quickly talk about what we have been doing at the high school. Um, when I was a freshman, we... We, the Safe Club has a program where we go to freshman classes um, towards the end of the year. We should be doing it in the next month or so. And we do a presentation to the science classes. We have all the science teachers' permission, and it's just one period. And we do a taste test, and we show a video, and we give them a bunch of facts about bottled water. And I very distinctly remember my, um, my class that year, um, and I have not bought a bottle of water since. I really didn't know much about bottled water before that, but I have not bought a single bottled water since that day, and I really hope that um, our efforts in school continue to have that impact on other people, and then maybe people will stop buying water, like you said, and then um, the school won't be so opposed to getting rid of the water bottle machines entirely. Thank you. Just the fact you're here talking about it as much as you are, the millions watching at home, and I do <laughs> I do expect to see you again at town meeting. However, uh, now, if, so if you want to just step to the side, we'll take other input, but I will let you speak at the end just before the board takes the vote, okay? Mr. Harrington, I saw first. Sean Harrington, Precinct 15, uh, town meeting chair. Um, I have actually, uh, for the record, what I'm going to say, um, so I was hoping I could uh, pass that out if that's okay to the members of the selectmen. Just give them to Ms. Mahan, she'll pass them along so you can speak. All right, first thing, there are some typos in here. I was at a conference, I only got about nine hours sleep in three days, so it's, <laughs> there are some typos, so please pardon that. Um, You're not reading this whole thing. Say, what? Right? You're not reading this I'm whole not reading the whole thing, I'm just going over it a little okay, bit, so. Uh, I mean, you can, Sean, but I, you know. No, 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 no. I do like to talk, but no, not tonight. <laughs> um, I just got in at midnight. I haven't had about two hours of sleep, so I'm okay. running on fumes. Um, so I have at the top of the bylaw. I'm not going to read it. Um, but it's based on environmental um, issues with plastic waste. Um, but I took a look at it. I contacted a woman named Adriana Cohen uh, from the uh, Concord for Consumer Choice, where um, they're currently fighting the bottled water ban in Concord. And we... and through links that she's given me, I kind of compiled some information that uh, <clears throat> in, in the case against the bottled water ban. The first one was comes to environment. Um, this ban doesn't uh, reduce plastic waste. If anything, um, it hurts our priorities to help the environment. Um, on page three, I have a quote by a woman named Maria Rodale. Now, Maria Rodale is the CEO and chairman of Rodale Inc. Um, and uh, Maria's company is the world's largest publisher of health and environmental content, um, such as men's health and what have you. And uh, her company also published Al Gore's book, uh, Inconvenient Truth. Um, she wrote an article for the Huffington Post called uh, The Bizarre Insanity of Banning Bottled Water, in which she stated, banning water might feel like a win in the short term, but it's a major loss in the long term. And the biggest loss is the misdirection of energy it creates and very intelligent people who could otherwise be solving real problems. Um, and she goes on later in the article to talk about recycling mandates um, when it comes to soda, banning soda or possibly. Um, so really, why, why do we say it's not, it doesn't help the environment? Bottled water is 100% recyclable. Um, you get rid of bottled water in stores, most likely, and people think when it comes to convenience. Not everyone remembers to bring a reusable container with them. I know that I have multiple of them, but I don't always bring them with me. So I go to the store and I buy a bottle of water. Um, 
for kids, if you're an you know, Audison student, you'll, usually you'll see them at some of the convenience stores. If they don't have bottled water, there's soda and high sugary drinks with twice the amount of plastic, PET and non-PET that they're going to be using. So really, what you're doing is you're increasing the, plast the amount of plastic in our waste by pass if, we, if this passes town meeting, because we're not, well, we're eliminating, yes, plastic bottled water, um, which is 100% recyclable. This is harder to recycle and higher amount of plastic and it's just giving kids a higher amount of sugar in their diet, which is something that I don't think any of us want to see. Um, <clears throat> now, the, uh, there's, I do have a quote here from uh, the Con uh, Concord for Consumer Choice. They have a website called Free the Water. Um, it says, in Concord, Massachusetts, while proponents of the ban um, have fought bottled water, they have ignored the environmental impact of other containers, leading people to make false choices to switch to less environmentally friendly packaging. For example, glass bottles take more energy to produce and transport than plastic can break and injure workers and are abrasive and wreak havoc on recycling equipment. Um, so it's harder to recycle and if anything, it, it will cost more in the long run if, let's say, nationwide or what have you, we go to ban or get rid of uh, these single serving containers. Um, when it comes to health and safety, uh, according to the National Sanitation Foundation, public water fountains contain 2.7 million bacteria cells in one cubic inch, even more than public toilets, which are sanitized more often. So <clears throat> one of the problems that I have with this is that but people don't really think of, uh, the problem is if you go to a drinking fountain, if you are sick, if you have, you know, if you have cancer or what have you, or some sort of illness, you're, gonna, you're most likely going to be drinking bottled water because, of, uh, because certain brands are, uh, purified differently and it makes it harder for people who are sick or elderly to, gr to get those uh, <clears throat> plastic bottle waters because they're going to have to go out of town. If they're going to have to go out, out of town for that, they're going to do their shopping out of town. Concord has seen around the area, Adriana Cohen has seen major amounts of sales going up around for businesses around Concord and less in, in, uh, in their town. Arlington wants to increase our, tr our tourism. It's a major thing that we want to do and as a uh, uh, Sleckman Curl said, do we really want to be that town that pushes that away? You know, it's, it's really about convenience. As sad as it is, we're a consumer society, we have to think about convenience. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It also goes against, you know, buying local. So it really does go against the grain of what we're trying to do here in Arlington. Um, now, re, uh, using reusable bottled water containers isn't always an available option. Outdoor, oh, I already went through that. Outdoor. I was say you've got, it, got yeah, most sorry. of it in. <laughs> um, the other problem is, is that let's say if we have another storm like we just had, and where uh, the governor uh, has a driving ban. If I, and there are many cases where your water system could uh, be, um, I don't know what the uh, compromised. Best, yeah, compromised. Uh, sorry, um, but if it's compromised, you're going to have you're going to have to drink bottled water, and stores are not going to keep a whole container or, or a whole bunch of. Uh, bottled waters in their storage area, taking up space for in the case of an emergency. They're just not going to do that. So what you're really going to have to do is call people to go in during a ban like that, driving on the road where they can have accidents and what have you, and it costs more. Um, there was another point that I wanted to make, and then I think I'll uh, <clears throat> shut up after that. <laughs> um, pers uh, what about personal freedom? This ban takes away residents' freedom of choice and promotes unhealthy choices. Um, we should have the right uh, we as citizens should have the right to decide what is best for our families and ourselves. Reducing waste is a great idea, um, but this should be encouraged by changing minds as uh, these young girls do. And I should also say I commend them uh, tremendously. I know what it's like to go up and uh, try to make a stand on things. A lot of people, you know, when I was in high school, I did the same thing with another issue. So I commend them a lot. I think there's a lot we can do with increasing the amount of recycling bins we have in Arlington, recycling mandates. There are many ways we can do this without necessarily getting rid of bottled water and solving the problem with most of our plastic containers. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is, is that uh, the other thing that uh, they had a concern about was when it came to the EPA's uh, regulation on plastic containers. Now that regulation is the same thing for plastic containers no matter what, food containers, milk, um, what have you. So really it goes for all food products and we're not going to go out and ban all fruit, food products from being sold in Arlington. So I mean, it, it, while it says yes bottled water, it's for all of them and also it's not as, and it hasn't been as big of a risk for people as people thought it's been kind of debunked uh, by uh, the bottled water industry and other um, consumer uh, choice industry um, leaders. So really that's my point. It's, it Thanks. seems like it'll hurt the health of Arlington. It'll hurt Arlington businesses as we've seen in Concord. It's hurt their businesses. And 
you know, there are other ways we can really solve environmentalism. I'm, I'm a strong supporter of environmentalism, as weird as that sounds, <laughs> um, being a Republican, but I, I really do. I think that we need to work toward environmentalism, but there are better ways of doing it than necessarily, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, son. And I do remember you as a senior in high school being before us on the Pledge of Allegiance. Or, right? You were a senior at that point, weren't you? What was that? You were a senior when you first... I was um, working on it my four years of high school, but it kind of came to a head my junior year going into my senior year. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak on this, sir? Hi, I'm Christian Klein. I'm a resident on Newport Street, and I'm also the events coordinator for the Friends of Robbins Farm Park. Um, we are a friends group for uh, the local park um, of across from the Brackett School. We host somewhere between 8 and 11 public events over the course of the summer, and we host a concession stand at, at probably the majority of those events. And uh, we do sell bottled water as one of the, one of the things we sell, and we would... Um, We've debated, as sort of as a group, we don't have an opinion on, overall on the issue of a, of a water ban, but what we would like to see if this goes forward is if there is a possibility for an exception for public outdoor events. Um, we don't have a good way of providing water other than to have it prepackaged um, at these kinds of events. And we've had incidents in the past where we have run We've basically run out of water at certain events before, and um, it has definitely caused concern among the, the police who are there and others for the health of the, and safety of people who are there. And uh, if, we, if it was a more limited supply of water at, at public events, we think it would be, you know, it would be a, not only difficult for us and difficult for people who are coming from out of town to these events, but it would also um, have some possible health impacts. And so... What we would like to encourage is if this does move forward, if there could be an exception for these public outdoor events um, where um, it could be stipulated that you know, the events have to be fully licensed through the, through the Board of Health, through the Re uh, Recreation Department, which they already are, and that they would have to have recycling uh, containers at the point of sale and at the point of waste. Um, and we would certainly be willing to abide by those kinds of considerations. So thank you. I mean, uh, just so you, you know, your best route, obviously, is try to amend this at town meeting, if indeed it comes up, at, if, it, if uh, this board doesn't vote it down. But I do see lots of issues with that. For example, town day, then, wouldn't that have to be exempted as well, as long as a number of others, right? But that's, a, anyhow, point well taken. Who else would like to speak on this? Okay, Amy, your team, if you'd like to make a closing statement, then the board will vote. Hi again. Um, we actually do agree with that amendment to uh, have an exception for outdoor town events. We've heard his points and we actually think that they're very well thought out and we are very receptive to that idea. So we very much um, do agree. We know this issue is very controversial and we do take into consideration all opposing points and we are just very much looking for the most environmentally friendly solution. That's very much what this is about. I hate using the word ban because it has a negative connotation to it and we want this to kind of more move in a positive, move at least Arlington in a positive direction to be um, a less consumption heavy and a less wasteful town. But thank you very, very much for uh, hearing us tonight and listening to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and the, one of the first rules you learn as you're a selectman is to count to three, and I think you've heard the comments from at least three of us so far. But I'm begging you, don't go away. I think we'll see you again at town meeting, but please come before us again at another time. And you're really to be commended for what you've done here and for the work you've done, but forgive me, I'm going against you. But you, you have, I, I really like Mr. Kiro's idea, strike first at home if you can, see what you can get done in the high school in, in terms of some of those other areas. But that said, does someone have a motion, please? With no action. A re recommendation of no action. Is there a second? Second. Second. And so what will happen at town meeting is we will, I believe, uh, make this recommendation of no action. However, you can substitute. So if I have a feeling you know that better than I do, Amy, and, and your, <laughs> your team. All those in favor of the recommended vote of no action, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Am I right? That was unanimous? Okay. All right. Thank you very Thank much you. for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Good luck, neighbor.
<laughs> well, no, she did a tremendous job. Yeah. So. Okay, Article 9, grant of easements for the Thompson School. Uh, this was related to the poll discussion last time. Yep. Juliana? Yes, yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, this was related to the uh, request of Verizon to um, obtain an easement from the town for the placement of three utility poles that are being moved from the sidewalk to onto um, actual grass area around the new Thompson School to accommodate a change in parking patterns. I did raise a concern at last week's meeting um, that I didn't really see why it was necessary. The board requested that I speak with uh, Verizon's council, which I did do. Um, although I'm still not thrilled, I'm going to withdraw my objection. That's just not worth having a big argument about. Um, I don't think that's good use of this board's time or town meeting time. So, um, you know, I, I would recommend that this board would support the request. I will certainly look very closely at the easement instrument when it comes before the board and um, make every effort to ensure it's not overly broad. But um, I would suggest at this point that this board um, take favorable action on the request. Can you do anything on the issue of the easement lasts for eternity? An easement does last for an eternity, which is my problem yeah. about it. Right. So no, we can't. Right. I mean, we're at a we're loggerheads with Verizon. They want it to last for eternity. I don't want it to. Right. Um, how do we take back an easement? Is that possible? We can take it back by eminent domain. Okay. Okay. Mr. Hainer, did you? I, did you want to speak? I see the school committee supports this. Yes. Okay. So nothing, nothing to add. Okay. Is there a motion? Move favorable action. Move favorable action. Second. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Dunn. Um, I'm having real second. I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sold on this one actually. Um, Is this something? It seems so pro forma, and what I'm hearing is we're all having. Oh, if I may, Mr. Burling, Mr. Dunn. I think it's the word permanent yeah. for easement. Could we maybe? Um, I would ask town council, do you think there's anything else that you could do to have the conversation? I know you can have the conversation, but I don't want to waste your time around that word permanent. If we could get some other type of an easement, or they're holding <laughs> hot and firm on permanent easement. Well, they are, but it's certainly within this board's purview to recommend. Uh, I mean, I don't know who's going to be around to enforce it, but it, I, I won't be. But an easement <laughs> that, um, you know, expires five years after the school comes down or something like that. I mean, their issue, because what, what, what the, the you know, discussion I did have uh, was, you know, we've got a school there, obviously we want the lights on. Their issue is those poles serve not only the school, but also the surrounding communities, and there will probably always be people there. So, um, the, you know, they view it as an investment of their time. And I, I don't think it's much of an investment, and I think they certainly um, recoup it very quickly in, um, in the um, charges that they get from ratepayers. But um, the, the reason for their position is that if the school, if the land is sold, if the school is taken down, you know, in 50 years, there will still be utility customers. But, um, you know, even if town meeting authorizes the grant of a permanent easement, this board can certainly choose to grant something less than that, or um, this board can ask town meeting to um, to grant less, you know, authorization for less. Um, I just didn't feel it was sort of a good use of anybody's time to. Right. No, I don't want you to argue sorry. with them any further. No, that helps. Uh, Mr. Dunn technically still is the floor. I don't know if he wants. So I'll just say that I'm torn between um, the. I agree. It's a stupid thing for us to be arguing about, and it's annoying that Verizon is being so annoying about it. But at the same time, I worry about um, I worry about the board, you know, 30 years down the road, saying, "Who are those morons who gave them a permanent <laughs> easement when they, there's no reason to give them a permanent easement?" And so there's expediency, and then there's, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure you'll still be here in 30 years, Mr. Green. <laughs> <laughs> What's for danger? I'll, I'll still be called a moron. So what the heck? <laughs> I'll say, it. Uh, Mr. Carroll. Um, I was just wondering, apropos of our conversation at the last meeting, can it be written? Can it be written into an ease? Can let me back up. Can an easement document instrument contain conditions? around the um, state of repair 
that uh, any any poles or any um, infrastructure mm -hmm. must be kept mm -hmm. in. Just like, I just figure, I mean, if, if, if we have to do this to facilitate the, the Thompson project, I'd love to at least be able to send the message again um, ar around the uh, subject we discussed last meeting. We can certainly put that language in. I, I can't really make a guarantee as to its enforceability, but right. we can certainly put it in. We can send a message. But the, the same thing we discussed before, state, uh, we'd be we'd trumped by the state uh, current laws, right, Re related to polls and stuff that were referenced before? Well, my, my issue has more to do with kind of the nature of the property right that's an yeah. easement. A an easement is a, it's, it's something less than full ownership, but it is an enforceable property right that has value. Um, whereas we're talking about like implementing regulation, I am certainly happy to write it that way. Um, and you know we can certainly make the argument that the easement would be revoked or curtailed in some way, um, and we could certainly keep a close eye on these polls. I don't think these polls, being brand new, are going to be at the top of the probably not. List. I would just love to to if if we have to do this, I would love to at least use use this opportunity to send the message once mm -hmm. again. And it would come back before the board after town meeting authorized it. And at that point, the board could still decline. All town meeting does is it authorizes the board to grant the right. It doesn't require the board to grant the right. Oh. Only the board can decide. I, I this to Julian as well. I assume that we need, that Verizon then needs to sign off on whatever we send to them. So with all these stipulations, they might choose not to agree with us. And then right, they can, and then, moving forward they can also you know kind of be a headache to us as well when you know say something like a microburst comes along again and we have to rely on them you know I think that we there's a very thin line that we have to walk on and I don't think that we should just be jumping you know over it and making you know real serious strides when you know this is a partnership and we will be relying on them at times as well so Well, the argument that was brought up tonight that was that made me look at this a little differently is because I am hesitant to give anything away for eternity. Um, but uh, the the fact that these polls are used for the neighborhood, the homes as well, and and you know, I mean, that's a pretty strong argument to, as well. Why these w these easements might survive the school, but you know, again, 30, 50 years or whatever way. Anybody else wishing to speak on this? Is there a motion from one of my colleagues, please? I move favorable action with the, the stipulations that I had laid out around trying to craft that easement document. Um, okay, and is there a second? Second. But am I, all we're bringing to town meeting is the easement, the easement correct, yeah, Juliana? Yeah, yeah. When it comes back to us to, de to decide whether to grant them or not, that's when we deal with this issue. But perhaps we could address that in the comment. Yeah. Correct. Sure. Okay. I, can, I can do both. Okay. All right. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Opposed. Okay. So four to, four to one. Uh, four to one vote. Uh, bylaw amendment, safe streets. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Oster. Adam Oster. Good evening, I'm Adam Oster, I'm from uh, Precinct 3. I uh, just want to check, do you have the report from the Transportation Advisory Committee on this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and I'm not sure how to proceed because I don't want to repeat from our previous meeting, but um, Ms. Mahan is here tonight, so h how much recapitulation is appropriate and how much should I skip? Um, Ms. Mahan, what do you feel you need? He was here at the last meeting uh, and went through this pretty. And I asked you to come back? No, you weren't here. Oh, oh okay. My only question, I know I'm saying, what did I ask him to give me? No, no, My no. only question that I have, and thank you for, for putting this back on, is, and you address it in here, I'm leaning towards this isn't something that's accomplished by a town bylaw. I think it's something that maybe the Board of Selectmen could take a vote on it, and I think it's more through the town manager. And th these are just my thoughts um, in the planning department. I think we're kind of he headed down that road. Perhaps if the Board of Selectmen, I'm just putting this before my colleagues. I'm not saying it's the answer because um, I don't want to get into because other people may come in and say, you know, autism is an important disease that we need to 
attack head on, yeah, the Board of Selectmen can vote that. Do we make that into a bylaw? But um, th th my only thing is I'm leaning towards that we accomplish this, but not through a bylaw. Um, maybe I'll just give a brief sort of mm -hmm. overall view, okay, sure. and then what I'd like to focus on are the changes that were made since our last, uh, since I was last sure. before you. Um, this is uh, obviously it's a, it's a general bylaw uh, about uh, street planning. It's not about traffic enforcement. It's not about the Mass Ave project. Um, it is proposed as a bylaw because only a bylaw can express the settled policy of the town at this level. Only a bylaw is permanent uh, in that, insofar as it outlasts individual um, uh, staff members, uh, however talented, uh, and it addresses uh, an issue of, I think, general concern to the community. Um, the, the changes since the last time, uh, I know, at the, uh, Mr. Chairman, at the end of, of the last meeting, you, you complimented me on being uh, receptive and flexible to changes which you called compromises, but I just want to make clear that I consider these to be improvements, uh, not things that I had to give up anything for. Um, and to characterize these, I would say that uh, generally about transportation projects, it seems to me that the large projects are designed under many different constraints. For example, the constraint that I think we're familiar with that requires pedestrian and bicycle accommodation is, is an example of, of such a constraint. Uh, and, but within these constraints, there are still some decisions that are made by the town. For example, during the Mass Ave project, there was a lot of back and forth about what would be best to have where we have room for it, a median strip or wider parking lanes, and those kinds of decisions uh, are judgments that the town makes. And it's um, the changes since the uh, last time I was before you are mostly to clarify that it's that narrow range that is the issue here. It's not to try to you know, expand the scope of projects beyond what's proposed uh, and beyond what's financially uh, feasible for the projects. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rademacher also was concerned that this proposal might be burdensome, especially for small projects. Small projects really don't have that scope. Uh, a curb cut is a curb cut. So one of the changes is a uh, half million dollar um, sort of floor on this, so it doesn't apply to the small projects. Um, uh, the bylaw also uh, expressly does not require the town to seek a design ex exception to state or federal uh, requirements. Town could do that if it wanted to, but not because of this uh, bylaw. Uh, again, the decision space is just this narrow area. Um, the standard also has been sort of toned down and made more flexible. That was something that I heard from the board um, two weeks, three weeks ago. Uh, and uh, the modest reporting requirement uh, is limited to the first 10 years after which it goes away. So I really have tried to uh, take into account everything that I heard. Um, in terms of the question of why a bylaw, why not a policy, uh, I sort of addressed that at the beginning and I would just say that I think that adding, adding the public to technical issues um, makes things harder in a lot of ways, but it also makes things better. Um, we saw that with the Mass Ave project, uh, I think on both counts. Um, our staff does its best work when there is appropriate collaboration uh, on public concern and professional expertise brought to bear, and that's what this does. This bylaw does not say there have to be bike lanes everywhere. It does not dictate a result. Uh, it sets uh, a general goal and leaves it to the professional staff um, and the volunteers of the town to, to implement it. And I think that that is the appropriate framework and it is appropriate for town meeting to be involved at that level. Thank you. Commissioner Mahan. I just want to give a case in point um, <clears throat> why I don't think this should be a bylaw. I've been on the board 14 years, so this predates this. This was when I was sitting in the audience the 10 years before and Mr. Greeley, Correct me if I stray on any of this, and I think Mr. Gilligan was here. I remember one of the importance, the way I see it is the town planning department, town manager identify 
what's important, what needs to be done, and why. And I remember way back when, I want to say 17, 18 years ago, there were a lot of people who were concerned about the bridge over Park Ave where the gas station is and four or five of those stores. That bridge had to be repaired. That was about a million dollars, just about a million. And we had state funding for it. And what happened was a lot of residents came in and said, you only have a, have a sidewalk on one side. That's not safe. And what the state said was, then you're going to have to foot the bill or we're not going to give you the money. And the issue was it would be another 800000 or more, something about a cantilever system. And, and it was, do we repair this bridge with state funding um, the way it wants to, the, the way we can get the money and get it done, or do we go out and foot that money? And my fear is, I know nobody, and I see that the Transportation Advisory Committee was divided on this being a bylaw, and I think this may be the very reason. Um, you're not going to do that. Nobody on the Transportation Advisory Committee would say, I'm going to say goodbye to a $1.1 million um, project. But if we have a bylaw and there's one resident, there were a good 14, 15 residents, and I can remember some of them because they live on Alpine Street. They wanted that second sidewalk, and they didn't care if it was, I think it was another 800000 And we're in um, danger of losing the funding. But Mr. Marquis and the board said, we, ideally, we'd like to do that, and we can't. So my point is, if this is a bylaw, we have to. I could see someone coming in saying, I, I want the sidewalk on both sides because that's the best pedestrian safety. You've already said in the bylaw that's your number one thing. I'd rather have it that, that it's a goal, it's a policy. But I'll leave it to my colleagues. But I, I won't vote it as a bylaw if you want to make that motion. Yeah. Can we speak on that? Um, yeah. No, I'd like to hear TAC. All right. Plus, anybody else? Yeah, I, well, I'd like to hear TAC or the town manager speak also, but, and specifically, um, you know, we have $500,000 is set here. I mean, realistically, what are we talking about as far as the number of projects that we'd be looking at compared to all of the work that we did in the course of a year? Mm -hmm. uh, Dave, uh, funny, because of all the other articles, I wanted to hear everyone what I wanted to say before I wanted to speak, but this time I want to speak before other people have things to say. Um, and that's because uh, I want to say what I'm, what I'm really debating with myself it is, is what Mrs. Mahan's point is, is whether or not it's, this is appropriate to put in a bylaw or not. And I'll tell you what I'm thinking about. And one is, uh, one of the things that the town has chosen to put in its bylaws is green design in terms of like building and, and acquisition of vehicles and things like that. And uh, it's one of the, and the way it ended up got, being written is that it doesn't actually enforce in most ways, but it was a clear signal by the town that this is the direction that we wanted to go in. And similarly, so, I'm not, the example that you brought up, Mrs. Mahan, I'm not concerned about because it says, and within the programmatic and fiscal scope of the design. And so if you have a design that doubles the price from a million to two million, you know, that would be, that to me would mean that I could, as a policymaker, I'd be able to disregard this because I feel like it was outside the scope. So, but I'm still hung up on the same question you are, which is, you know, do we care, you know, how much, I guess part of me is how much do we care about this and do we, want to put this down in the books. And so the reason I brought this up, because I'm curious what other people who come to the microphone have to say on that. Uh, the town manager was signaling wildly and I ignored him. Oh. <laughs> Adam? The, the yeah, I, do you mind if I? Uh, Not at all. Should we, so I, I, I agree with, with TAC and I agree with the intention of Mr. Oscar. I think the intention of this uh, proposed bylaw in this article is, is very well intended. Uh, but my concerns are around enforceability and applicability. Uh, I, I find so that there's a lack of uh, a third party arbiter or even a within party arbiter to decide whether or not we're meeting the standard. And to the point Mr. Dunn just raised, uh, that, that when you first said that, I started thinking, well, you're right about the green building or hybrid or fuel efficient vehicles. Uh, but in terms of building, there are third party standards and certifications which need to be met under that bylaw, whether it be LEED certified or another energy efficient design that you need a third party to come in and say, yes, you've built to that standard. And for the fuel efficient <coughs> policy, uh, it just asks to buy the most fuel efficient vehicle available that can get the job done. So that, that's, with the EPA, fuel estimates in miles per gallon, it's a pretty easy standard to meet. I'm concerned here that there, there is no standard to meet and there's no one to arbitrate whether or not we are meeting up with this or not. And in regards to the applicability, uh, in talking with the DPW director uh, today, um, the $500,000 amount really would apply to, to well, actually, I should say, when you take the $500,000 amount 
and on top of the fact that uh, we'd also have to work within state and federal requirements, there could be no projects that this bylaw applies to. Um, you know, if, you know, in terms of Mass Ave corridor, it would certainly meet the threshold of $500,000, but we're working with state and federal requirements there. So we, we could be putting ourselves in a situation where there's a bylaw passed uh, that is unenforceable and is not applicable to anything the town does. So th those are my concerns with, with moving forward on this bylaw. You know, it, it's, it's one of those where I believe we all agree a thousand percent with the intent, but it's the implementation of it. And, and I can't imagine us doing a project where we aren't first and foremost thinking about pedestrian safety uh, anyhow, but who'd like to speak on this? Jeffrey? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Jeff Max Tudis, co-chair, uh, Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, with me is uh, Scott Smith, Elizabeth Carr Jones, Ed Starr. Um, as you said, Kevin, uh, we're all bef behind the intent of this, um, with the emphasis on pedestrian safety. Um, it's something TAC, yourselves, other um, boards, um, commissions deal with uh, on all projects. So we were, we were split on this one. Um, one is, is it actually necessary you know, to have this bylaw? Uh, we put great importance on pedestrian safety and every, every project in town, um, schools, safe routes, uh, with DPW, planning department. So one issue the TAC had was, is, is it actually necessary to have a bylaw? The other is the balance with other modes. Is it prioritizing pedestrians over other modes? We try to strike a balance of equity in town bicyclists, motorists, transit, so forth, uh, people, accessibility issues. So um, we had those two issues. Um, we made some recommendations to the language. Uh, we thought it improved it. Um, even with that, I think the tech had probably the closest vote in its history on this issue. <laughs> four, uh, four in favor, two against, and two abstain. Uh, so it, it passed by one vote. So it, it shows you there was some uh, indecision uh, within the, the TAC itself. Um, with that, it, it did pass um, marginally, but uh, it, 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 there, there are benefits uh, to a, a pedestrian policy, uh, but there are issues, um, Adam said, with uh, enforceability. So um, that's, that's where the TAC stands. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Anybody else wishing to speak on this? Okay. Someone talk to me up here then. Oh, let the other end. I'm talking to you. Okay, Mr. Kiro. Well, I, I just wanted to add a little, little bit. Uh, you know, I think the last time, you know, when Mr. Oster was here, I think I said that there, there can be a place in law and bylaws for aspirational language. I mean, just look at the Constitution. It starts with aspirational language right before it gets into laying out the rules of the, of the land. Um, and I think Dan gave some, Mr. Dunn gave some good examples of aspirational language we have in the bylaws. But I think as I walk it back and I think about how we started the meeting tonight, uh, meeting um, the um, consultant's gonna be working with us on the master planning process. And I'm wondering if at this moment in time, if we aren't better served by trying to in, in, embed this aspiration th through that process first before we consider going a, a bylaw route. I, I assume there are going to be a number of um, bylaw recommendations and, and other recommendations that come out of that process ultimately. Um, and uh, so I, I think, although I so agree with the aspiration, uh, Mr. Oster, I, I think I, I'm going to find myself, I'm going to move no action Second. on this. Yeah. Thinking that after the math to plan, that might that we could consider something like this. Okay. Yep. Um, Mr. Burn. I I agree with the no action vote as well. But I, of course, you know, I, I think we can't say it enough that we agree with the intent. Um, and one thing that stuck out to me was Mr. Chaplin's comment about the, you know, enforceability and. What happens when, you know, citizens come up to us and ask about, you know, how the enforcement of this is going? And then time after time after time, we just have to say, you know, there's no, we, we haven't really had the opportunity to. And I think not that, you know, the phrasing of it isn't, you know, in the town's best intent, but I think it might not 
be appropriate to have something on the books that we essentially will never use. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I agree with the no action vote. Anything else? Okay. All right, I'll give you, if you wanna, you wanna make a final <coughs> plea, Adam. Uh, I'll just thank you for your, for your courtesy. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't agree, obviously, but I, I do understand. I've, I've heard these arguments and I've thought about them uh, a great deal and they don't strike me as, as unreasonable. Um, uh, so you, depending on what happens with master planning, you may hear from me on this again. Well, and, or, and, on, or, and or on anything else, Adam. I would certainly always like to hear from you. <laughs> Uh, on the motion by Mr. Kiro, recommendation of no action. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you. Uh, Article 19, do we establish the Noise Abatement Committee? God, for once it's at my height. <laughs> Um, I'm Jeannie Leary. I'd like to thank you very much for t giving me the opportunity to do this. And I'm going to be quick because I know you guys are tired and so am I. Um, I'd like to thank Marie Kapelka too for helping me get the research on this. So real quickly, I just want to go through a real quick history of what's happened here in Arlington with noise. So in 1998, we actually developed the noise abatement article in May. And then in December, we made a noise abatement committee. And then in 2003, the community reported that they couldn't really do their um, job because they didn't have a noise meter. And then in 2005, they really amended the policy to reflect the federal standard. And in 2006 and 2007, the Summer Street Group really heavily utilized them. And I really want to commend John Leonard in particular, who was out at all hours of the night with us, and um, Frank Siano and John Fitzmorris, who were the only three that were left at that time on the committee. So they were great. Um, then in 2008, the leaf blower committee came up, the leaf blower issue came up first. It also, we had filed the noise abatement amendment because of noise with the sports complex. Both of those at the time were no action and they were sent to the noise abatement committee. 2009, the noise abatement committee disabled, not disabled, disbanded, sorry, disbanded. Um, they were down to three members, they didn't have the noise meter and there wasn't any current issues. But then lo and behold, the very next year, we had two things. We had a, a fire alarm nuisance warrant article and we had a bug zapper warrant article. In 2005, there were five warrant articles, mainly from our group, and we worked them out with the Park and Rec Commission and Paul Carroll from Little League, who were wonderful. So we got those, uh, a whole amplification policy done. And then 2012, the leaf blower came back. And since that has come back, from what I can make out, we spent roughly $30,000 on a special election, $6,000 for a town meeting, and we have another town meeting coming up on the 24th. So I mean, never mind the administration costs and, and that kind of stuff, but we're over 42,000 already just on one noise article. And so it, what I wanted to prove is it's coming up year after year and we don't have a noise abatement. Um, the next thing I wanted to say was why is it an issue? And in Arlington, we are the most densely populated town in the Commonwealth, and we're getting more and more so. I know on Summer Street Mill, between Sims and Brigham's, we got 400 more units opening in the next year. Um, I'm an RN, so I'm really into health, and there are a lot of repercussions from being exposed to noise. Um, the, I was really surprised. I haven't looked into noise in a couple of years, and the amount of articles that are out there now are just mind-blowing. It's really becoming a really hot issue. Um, but everything from um, hypertension, heart disease, uh, provoking aggression, now they say in childhood development, birth defects. I mean, it's just unbelievable what they were saying. So what I'm asking for is if we could please reestablish the Noise Abatement Committee. And if I had my druthers, I would like it to be a Selectman's Committee. Um, I don't know if that's possible, like a TAC Committee because I think it's a real important public health issue. And I really think it should be, the issues that are come up should be in front of you and the committee working together. Plus that I think then we could have the police and the-, um, the um, Board of Health. Board of Health, yeah. Um, what happened before is in the past when we've called to get noise meters, um, 
either the noise meters weren't working or they couldn't, the noise meter that was there couldn't get the kind of noise that we were recording. Um, and then when I, then Board of Health closes at four, so if you called at night, the police don't have any, they're not trained, only certain people in the Board of Health were trained. So I thought if we had a committee, even the committee could get trained, you know, and, and everyone would get trained so that we had some, some clout. My main purpose is to take out the subjectivity and make this objective. Rather than, for, for instance, if Carol Band was bothered by ABC Landscaping Company and she approached you or the Noise Abatement Committee, someone could go to the ABC Landscaping and, and test their, their blowers. I mean, whether it happens, you don't expect police to leave a crime scene to do this, but they could go later and check their blowers. And if they're 50 over, well, then they can't use their blowers. Do you know what I mean? It, it, make it objective rather than, you know, a bug zapper bothers me or this bothers me. If we had a committee and a, a meter, we could just nail these things out and not have to go through this stuff. So that's all I wanted. Okay. Thank you. Yep, Mr. Dunn. Uh, one question. So you said in your notes, uh, or you said that the committee was disbanded in 2009? Yeah. Where did you, what's your source on that? I'm just trying to figure out. Did they tell you? So, yeah. Um, John Leonard said, said he thought it was 2008. But then when I was just going through all the stuff, Marie <laughs> and everything, um, I figured out it couldn't have been 2008 because in 2008 there were two noise um, abatement things, the leaf blower and, and the one I had put in. And John told me they disbanded because there was no issues at that okay. time. So it had to be the beginning of 2009. So do you think they actually, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is, would, did, would, do you think they went to town meeting and said, please dissolve they this did. committee? They, they did. I remember them doing yeah, it. Yeah, it was I one of my first them years. Doing it. I don't remember the year, but I remember them doing it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> Ms. Mahan was next. And I, I think I remember, and John might have done it from the back of the Hall when he said, he basically said, I want to disband this committee because we're not getting anything. We don't have enough members. And, and mm -hmm. in my, I think I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. So what I think what Ms. Leary is saying, um, I think there is a need for some form of, especially in light of everything that we've been going through, um, whether it's a town meeting c committee or whether it's a board of selectmen committee. But my, my first premise would be, what are we agreeing on that this committee will and can accomplish? Because I don't want to set up like we did John and Frank and the other John, and basically their hands were tied. Um, I'm sort of thinking out loud. Like, I, I, I'm, you know me in committees sometimes. <laughs> but I, I, I get the points that she's, she's uh, presented before us, and I'm, just trying to, I'd like to hear from my colleagues their thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I have Mr. Byrne next. I'm gonna okay. Go. Um, one thing that I am uncomfortable with, with forming this committee, I think it might come down to what Ms. Mahan was mentioning about what actually goes before this committee. Um, but when you talk about having clout and, you know, actually being trained on these devices, um, I'm not 100% comfortable with town-owned devices being, um, yeah. you know, lent out uh, regularly um, to uh, committees. And um, so that's one topic. And the other is that when it does come down to this cloud, I don't think that, you know, residents that are suspected of noise violations, um, I don't think it's appropriate for a committee member to go and address that issue. It should be a member of the Board of Public Health or of the Police Department. So I think that there are, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not quite ready just to form this committee and, um, you know, kind of, I think we need to really talk out, talk over some more restrictions to what, how the committee will, you know, go about their business. Um, so I am uncomfortable with that. Mr. Carroll? I, I agree that there's a gap for a lot of the reasons that Ms. Larry said. I mean, we, we had the leaf blows, we had the bug zappers, we had the ice cream trucks. We, <laughs> we've had a lot of these things come up. Um, and I also agree that, that we need to be very careful about what the, the scope of the, of the charge is. It, it seems to me that the, an appropriate role for a noise abatement committee is to, um, when a proposal is brought forward, such as the ones I just listed, to analyze them in, in the context of the bylaws that we have and to make recommendations to us regarding any potential 
by law or policy changes, not not to be doing um, the the job of 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 you know town employees or supervising town employees. It's just not appropriate. I also think that it's important though that that um, if we were to reestablish this, that that we make sure that the members have some you know relevant scientific, technical, or engineering experience. Um, I remember when the first noise abatement bylaw was passed, one of the best presentations at town meeting that I've seen, other than the chickens, one of the best ones that, I, that I've seen was, um, you know, Ron Spangle brought in the, the, uh, the, the noise generating equipment and, and the meters and then went through to make the case for, for the, uh, the bylaw and I thought it was uh, actually a pretty good presentation. <laughs> Presentation at that point, and it was really approached from an objective kind of scientific um, viewpoint. So I, I think that this could be useful, as if we, look, especially if we look at the Leith Baller saga, where we went through two iterations of trying to form the proper committee and such, rather than having someone that to to refer it to, and someone with appropriate technical expertise, like our TAC folks, they have technical expertise. We're able to, we know that we can rely on them for very specific. Um, purposes I, I'm, I'm torn as to whether I, I think Ms. Lear, you, you said you wish you'd like it to be a selectman's committee in which case we would then just vote no action on this and and and, and move to create that as a selectman's committee I, I'm not I don't have a strong opinion on that if it were to go through a town meeting I would want it to be appointed by the town manager subject to the approval of the selectman in a, in a lot of ways, I think I feel that that's more appropriate because that there is some inter, so much interplay with police and public health and such. But that's kind of where. I Just to that point, um, if it's a town meeting member committee, the moderator will make the appointments, um, be, and that kind of ties our hands, <clears throat> like TAC and like our other committees that we have, even the tree committee. Yeah. The board of selectmen oversees it. We advertise. We collect the resumes, the CVs. And then we appoint different people. Sometimes it's a compilation our, ourselves, the town manager and department heads, to say who, especially around TAC and some of the other more technical committees. I don't see t town meeting, I don't think having this be another town meeting committee is the way to go because I don't see the town moderator, and I don't know if it's allowed, under, I have it here though, town meeting times, that the moderator sort of abdicates. If it's a town committee, it's the moderator doing appointments. Well, maybe not, but I, I, the purpose of going to I think to there's town precedent meeting, to do it otherwise, but I, yeah, but but I, I, I can buy it as a, as a selectman's committee because I would see that it would be advisory to us when we're making it. And then we could work system. with, we could ask the town but, manager and or Board of Health, whoever he deems appropriate, to sort of, and, and I'd be happy to, and I'm terrible with returning your phone call. I apologize. I've had That's no problem. great birth and then a relative this weekend in the ER. So I, but um, maybe we could, or maybe if you want to, Mr. Kiro, Mr. Dunn, and I'd side pinch hit with Ms. Leary and the town manager, sort of come up with some draft language of what this selectman's committee could look like and then go from there. So if it's okay, unless I'd be inclined to vote no action before us with the comment that the selectmen are working on possibly establishing another selectman appointed committee. Mr. Dunn. Uh, I'm comfortable with no action and researching it further. I do have two thoughts that I, um, one is I, um, I, other members have said it and I agree, is that I don't think it's appropriate for the committee to be an enforcing body or, or even, and so it's just, it, 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 it's very difficult. And so I, I, that's not, but at the same time, the policy recommendations and things like that, I think makes sense. I can look backwards and I can think of things that the noise abatement committee would look at. For instance, the noise abatement bylaw, leaf blower bylaw. So, but I'm also trying to think about when we talk about what it should be going forward. Is what would be the first or next task this committee has? And I confess, right now I have a blank. And until I can answer the question of like what it is that I want the committee to do, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I need to understand that better. Mm -hmm. Maybe that will flush out. Yeah, I mean. I would argue that leaf blowers has been torture, yes. um, mm. and I believe that those who uh, have gone and tried to silence leaf blowers, I believe the next issue is noise abatement will have to deal with our gas-powered snow blowers, mm. gas-powered lawn, lawn mowers, 
uh, gas powered electric trimmers, whatever. I do, you know, so I, I'm, I'm not worried that there's not going to be some issues uh, there for them to deal with. But I do like the, personally like this idea of let's say no action on this, but ask that uh, Ms. Leary, Ms. Mahan, Mr. Kiro, and Mr. Chapdelaine, and I would think Christine Conley as well, if she's willing, uh, would, uh, would get together and really uh, come back to us with a recommendation of uh, this board putting together some sort of a committee. If, that, if someone would make that motion, if you're, if you're happy with that. Okay. Yes? So Should moved. I make a, yeah. yeah. So Second. moved, seconded. Yes. All right, is this okay with you, Jim? Oh yeah, this is fine. Um, I did want to add that um, John told me that Ron Spangler figured out the noise meter. Um, as, and the reason why they were doing the readings was because they didn't have the town people on the thing. So if it's a selectman committee, that'd be great. Uh, now I gotta <coughs> confess. I realized two hours ago <laughs> that as I was running off these things, because I told Marianne on Friday, I don't need anything, you know, you don't have to run anything off of them, that I inappropriately copied the noise abatement standard number on the warrant. So I made you copies of what the right number was supposed to be and a copy of the old bylaw so you can see it's the right number. And I don't know if I did this right, but I wrote a substitute motion because I don't I don't know how well, we're to fix voting, it. Yeah, no, we're voting no action. We're going to vote no action, so it doesn't really matter. So it doesn't matter. matter. Doesn't oh, it doesn't matter? matter? No, no, no. I should have done this before, Marie. Right. <laughs> cool. So what we're recommending is we're going to recommend no action on this to town meeting, but we are taking an action, which is asking you to work with Adam, Christine Conley, Mrs. Mahan, and Mr. Curo, and come back to this board with the, with the idea of what's the Selectman's Noise Abatement Committee to look like. And if I could just add one more thing I think they could start with is our noise law is written that um, violations are 50 decibels above ambient noise. So they could start taking the baseline readings um, in areas that are a concern because then if there's a complaint, if they go out and the reading is 50 over that baseline, that, that's when you get the violation. So another thought. But thank you for your time and thank, thank you, you for allowing me to address thank you. you. All right, so all those in favor of the motion of no action and uh, then the second uh, part of it, which is uh, to for this group to get together and then come back to us with the recommendation. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. One of the very first issues I dealt with on this board was silencing the horn in Arlington oh, Center. And you want to talk about people not being happy with you. Um, <laughs> Thank you but, very much. But the, the issue was a quarter of seven in the morning was really bothering people who had kids who were now many more residences closer to the central fire station. Uh, so the, the, um, what we, the, uh, the compromise was let it, let it go at noon and then a quarter of seven at night. But then because of the level of noise, it had to be silenced except for no school and other issues like that anyhow. Uh, Article 22, Home Rule Legislation, the Municipal Finance Department, Mr. Chapterlain. Uh, so, as the board knows, uh, this matter uh, really started two town meetings ago with Article 51 being voted uh, with the intent of investigating or studying the possible consolidation of a town school financial operation. That resulted in the Department of Revenue's Division of Local Services performing a study uh, last year and issuing a report in January of 2012 uh, recommending a number of change, uh, changes to both the town's financial structure as well as down the road considering a town school financial consolidation. Uh, moving from January into the spring and leading to town meeting, uh, I presented the findings of the DOR report to town meeting. Uh, town meeting voted to accept the report, uh, and I also made a recommendation that I would convene a coordinated finance stakeholder group uh, to study the DOR's recommendations, uh, but to also, uh, from the stakeholder group, which was made up of uh, the comptroller, the treasurer, myself, the deputy town manager, a representative from the board, uh, Selectman Byrne, a representative from the board of assessors, uh, the CFO from the school department, as well as the payroll director. Uh, so we met uh, nine times over the, su the summer and fall, uh, really starting from the ground up in ways to improve our financial operation uh, from the town perspective. Uh, we then uh, issued a series of recommendations that I know the board saw, and those recommendations included creating a coordinated finance department, uh, establishing a professional appointment process for the comptroller, for the treasurer, uh, which would mean removing the treasurer from uh, an elected office and making, an appoint, uh, making it an appointed office. Uh, we then had a public input session uh, in December on those recommendations uh, where all the members of the Coordinated Finance Stakeholder Group uh, listened to input from the public on those recommendations. Uh, and we continued to develop backup and more information 
And I, I know myself and other members of the stakeholder group felt very strongly that we'd put a very sincere, uh, authentic proposal on the table that would improve and professionalize the town's financial operation. Uh, however, uh, when uh, a presentation on that proposal uh, was delivered to the Finance Committee last week, uh, there were a number of issues raised by the Finance Committee uh, and a great deal of concern raised by the Finance Committee. And the Finance Committee ultimately voted no action on the proposal uh, that was filed under uh, Warrant Article 22. Uh, so based on those concerns and based on the, the position of the Finance Committee, and really the, the position being that the community, and at, at least from the Finance Committee and, and those on the fin Finance Committee, the community not being ready for this change, uh, I asked the Board to take a vote of no action on this Warrant Article, uh, but also asked them to take a position on uh, favoring uh, and, and being supportive of a coordinated or consolidated financial approach for town operations, but understanding that there are some issues that can continue to be addressed based on the concerns that were raised by the Finance Committee uh, and potentially pursue uh, these or similar actions in the future. Okay. Move no action. Move no action. Second. Second. Discussion here, Mr. Dunn. Um, I am going to support the motion of no action, but I'm going to also be really unhappy about it, uh, but I agree with the assessment that it's uh, uh, that we haven't got the consensus that we need. I really would like our comment to, to indicate that we, that we think that there needs to be changes. I'm, I think that our current, uh, when, we, you know, when we talk about ways that we can stretch out our money and the ways that we can make our, uh, pro prolong the, the time between overrides and so on and so forth in terms of our structural deficit, I really think that a coordinated finance group would uh, help that, but sometimes, uh, you know, the doctor makes a recommendation, but the patient doesn't necessarily agree with the doctor, and uh, the patient isn't going to take the medicine, and so I think that it is where that's where we are. So I will support the motion of no action, and I'm going to grumble. Okay. Mr. Byrne? Um, I will be grumbling as well. Um, I've, as Ms. Chaplain mentioned, I was on this committee, and uh, we worked for several months very dil diligently on an array of topics, you know. I know it comes, a lot of people saw it as an elected versus appointed treasurer, but that is not, that wasn't even, I would say, the main focus of what the discussions were based around. We talked about uh, improving the technology. We talked about breaking down silos. We talked about a whole range of things that I think would help to move the town forward. And it, it does appear that, you know, the town currently might not be ready to take those steps forward, unfortunately. Um, I hope that the town manager will take steps to um, move forward the conversations that have already take place and, you know, to see if there are some implementations of certain things that came up in the discussion that can be changed without this legislation. And um, I hope that we can address this again in uh, the not so far away future as I think it is in the best interest of the town. Thank you. Ms. Mahan? Yes. Yeah. Um, I just w wanted to say that some of the things that weren't sitting well with me, um, and I agree with the town manager that we need to continue to explore this, is that we asked, you know, we started on this road to get a town school financial consolidation. My personal opinion only, and no ill intent meant to anybody, but we commissioned the DOR um, which basically just looked at the town and it, I was told well that we have to start with that first and then we'll get to the school and I never felt that the school bought into there was never a vote or anything as well as DOR came out with like eight or nine recommendations I'm just gonna say that number it may be five it may be something else and when different stakeholders appeared before us and said you know um, I think it was ZBA or was one of them or assessors I can't remember who but the comptroller saying I shouldn't don't follow Mass DOR's recommendations leave me the way I am um, my thing was either you take all the recommendations which I didn't want to um, so what I'd like to do moving in the future I'd like to take all the good work that Mr. Byrne and um, Mr. Chapelain and others have done I know you cited some of the steps and technologies that you've identified and things that we can do to improve um, definitely work on those definitely work on the original mandate and working with the treasurer and everyone else but I'd like to also down that road that we're traveling and maybe this will make it more palatable to the citizens of the town that they see this as we're looking at how we consolidate town and school financial operations not that, that either side is controlling one another but that we're all doing business the same way that if you say to the town I'd like to see transparency on this issue 
we give the same kind of report, the same kind of format, and then they go to the schools. And they, that's, you know, I'd like to, I know it's putting another thing on the plate of what you have to accomplish. So that's my only comments. And just a quick response to that, if I could, Kevin. Um, the schools were very active in the conversations that we had uh, over the past several months. Um, the school CFO was on the committee and she was an asset to us. Um, we really, uh, I, it's my opinion that we cannot move forward um, with this proposal or any proposal without doing the town side first. And um, you know that, that came up and that was addressed very early on in the meeting, so I just want to clarify that. Mr. Carroll. And I think, just very briefly, I think that what uh, Mr. Byrne just said, I think comports with what the DOR had recommended. I mean, I, I've, I've been a supporter of this process from way back. Even when I was sitting on the school committee, I supported looking at the consolidation with the, the school department as well. It, it, you're right. There, is a, there are definitely split um, thoughts on, on that. But um, I think the DOR was pretty clear about looking at how we can um, you know, centralize some of our management functions um, here and, and make sure that, you know, accountability and responsibility, you know, are both held, you know, within the same line of authority. Um, so I hope that we can, I mean, do you feel clear, uh, Mr. Manager, I mean, on, on some of the steps that we, we can take to, to move forward and, and um, address some of the questions that were raised by the, the FinCom? Um, I feel clear that there are some issues that we could have substantive change made to, and there are other issues that may be more deep-seated and not as cut and dry. Uh, yeah. So I think it's a, a bit of a mixed bag to, to your question. Okay. Anybody here wishing to speak on it? Mr. Hainer. Good evening, Bill Hayne, a Precinct 2 town meeting member, and I'm speaking as a town meeting member, not as a school committee member. Um, you all know the history behind this. Ms. Chaplain uh, did a good job outlining it. Two years ago, uh, Article 51 was passed by the town meeting. It directed the town manager to uh, look into a consolidated town and school finance. Uh, it was almost 15 months later before any group, as far as I know, was put together. The DOI report that came that, and put the hat back on a school committee member, we saw it, we didn't feel, I didn't feel comfortable with it, and I think the majority of the committee did not feel comfortable at that time, and took no vote, didn't take any action whatsoever. That original Article 51 said, charged the town manager to get the selectmen uh, and the school committee and other groups involved in this. As far as I know, and I've gone back and looked at the minutes, the school committee, as a group, has never been involved in this, for input in this type of thing. Um, the, and I'll stop if there's a, a reaction to that, I'm sorry. Well, you I just I, heard I, the assistant superintendent was part of this committee, right? Assistant superintendent? Or, or CFO. CFO. Oh, CFO, well, CFO, right, I, I consider her. The, I, if, if I may, I know yeah. certainly members of the school committee were interviewed by the Department of Revenue and the DESC's uh, representatives who were part of the DOR reports. The school committee was included in that process. There was no report to the board of the school committee as a group. If they acted as individuals, as I'm acting as an individual tonight, they did not represent the school committee because when a school committee member, and I've been taught this, and I think every school committee adheres to this, when they speak as a school committee member, they have a duty and obligation to make sure that they're speaking as a, a, a group. They have, they're supposed to qualify that. So if, if they did meet, there's nothing in the record, our records indicating that the school committee spoke to the DOR. Individual members of the school department may have been interviewed. I can't argue with that. Right. So you I'm, not, I'm not here. So you weren't, Bill, anyhow. No. Okay, that's clear. And there's there's no record. I'm not here to argue with this. I'm just trying to share. The other night at the uh, Finance Committee meeting, there were two major issues that were brought up, and it ended up in a 13-5 vote for no action. And... Uh, I think, I think the idea of finding good ways of good management and sharing things like that, I think that that's, everyone wants that. And if we can come up with one, one way that works for everybody to work together and share things like that, I support that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Healy. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be brief, Mike Healy, Precinct 13. 
I uh, attended the Finance Committee meeting the other evening. A lot of good questions to ask Kevin, and I think what we have to do is build on some of those questions. I have for some time been very concerned about the lack of vetting of the DOR report, about who reports to who in the town, the organizational behavior, if you will, maintenance department, why it's in a certain department, why the budget is in the school department as opposed to um, the manager's budget. There's an endless list of things that we can go through, and I think we should. Um, and, but again, my major concern was that the DOR was never vetted, it was never discussed. And just picking up on what Mr. Hainer said, I did some investigation as well, and I don't remember any formal vote of the Arlington School Committee inviting the DOR to Arlington, and that bothered me as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It certainly was vetted here at this meeting. Yeah. And, and, and it was vetted throughout well, you the... You said it uh, wasn't, <laughs> Michael, so... It was yes. vetted throughout the CSFG uh, as well, so... Yeah, I think it is important to build on what Selectman Byrne is saying. Uh, the, the first thing the Coordinated Finance Stakeholder Group did was uh, each respective party uh, as part of the town's finances were asked to analyze their section or any comments that were made within the DOR report. So we actually did vet. We went through a vetting process uh, and discussed it as a, as, a, as a group. So I think it's, it's no important to mention. There, okay. Wait for the microphone. Mr. Chapterlane, sorry. I, I just want, I mean, it's important to make clear that that document served as the foundation and springboard for the discussion, and, and then we moved from there. Okay. Mr. Gilligan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, you have a memo from me uh, regarding my opinion uh, on this Warren article, so I will not belabor the point uh, by reviewing that memo in detail. Um, I would like to say that uh, I was at the Finance Committee meeting on Wednesday the 13th, uh, presented my issues with respect to the Warren article on a consolidated finance department. I will say uh, two points. Uh, I disagree with what was said about the DOR report being vetted. Uh, the stakeholder group of which I was a party did not review each of the points raised in that report, uh, but I don't want to belabor that. I do support uh, a vote of no action on this Warren article, but I would also like to say that I have written to the current town manager and the previous town manager and the capital planning committee about issues that face uh, the, the, the various financial departments in the town and their interoperating capabilities, and that includes the assessors, the comptrollers, treasurer, and payroll. And as I have always stated, uh, I work collegially with the town manager, and I look forward to working with him on specific issues that relate to the the uh, operations of financial matters within the town, whether that be financial applications, technologies, uh, review of processes and procedures. So uh, that's the comment I'd like to make. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Please. I'm Jennifer Watson, Precinct 2. I'm a citizen, concerned citizen. Uh, I support the vote of no action. I was at the Finance Committee meeting and I think some of the concerns were, were very... Michael, step outside if you want to have conversations. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, I think some of the concerns that were raised uh, were very important. But uh, as a voter, I would just like to say that I think checks and balances have been built into the Arlington Town Manager Act. And um, I, I think that... It, one can't be uh, hasty in making it an important change. Um, and, and human nature needs those checks and balances. Uh, and I think that uh, our town has been very fortunate that we haven't had a lot of corruption. And I think that one of the reasons why is because of our structure. Um, and I think that uh, a highly functioning uh, town hall in general is, is a result of our town government. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so the motion was made by Ms. Mahan, seconded by? Um, Mr. Dunn. Ms. Yeah, maybe, uh, I don't even remember. Right. Sorry. Mr. Dunn, I'm going to save my comments till after the vote. So all those in favor of the motion of no action, please, uh, recommendation of no action, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And all those opposed, nay. 
All right, so it's a four to one vote. While I agree with this board and with Adam Chapter Lane that this, uh, that there's more work needs to be done. Uh, unfortunately, I'm the one up for re-election, and uh, Jessica, thank you for providing this to me, but uh, I've been on cable now, and I've given two public speeches where I made the statement, this, I believe, is very important to the future of Arlington, and I am committed to working on this reorg. Uh, should I be re-elected to this board, and I will over the next three years. So I just, because I publicly made that uh, statement that I felt we should uh, be voting this at town meeting this year. I understand there's some issues that need to be dealt with, uh, but I certainly think the committee has been very open. Uh, the DOR has been vetted by this board, and if people didn't want to listen to it or pay attention to it, that's not our issue here. And we have all along talked about, first let's get the town's financial uh, management in order, and then we will indeed be working with and bringing in the school. So there was nothing done to exclude anybody at any point along the way. But uh, this is very important for our future, and as long as I sit on this board, I'm gonna fight for it. So forgive me for going against you, because I do think your strategy is right at this point in time. Okay, Article 23, Home Rule uh, Legislation Public Art Fund. Jane. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I'm Jane Howard from Precinct 10, also a member of the Public Art Committee, which is under Vision 2020's Culture and Recreation Task Group. And uh, I thank you for hearing this article and also for uh, adding the word special legislation to the title as it appears in the, in the warrant at this stage. Um, as you know, uh, in 2006, we came to you for, or mostly to the um, Finance Committee, but also to you, about establishing a fund for the water bodies. And it has been a wonderful thing because water bodies and art and other things happen at different times during the year, and if you can establish a fund and have some money to do something, then you don't have to wait for the general fund or anything else to happen. And I think this is true of public art as well, and I hope that you vote favorable action. The Finance Committee decided not to hear this. They just think it's your article. And if I may, it's, it's mainly to give you a mechanism for the raising of funds. Is that the yes, idea? Indeed. Yes, indeed. Okay. okay. Um, discussion? Yeah, Mr. Dunn? Um, so the, for the ones for the water bodies, that was, the town was already paying money for the water body um, uh, preservation. It was like, you know, as in, uh, sorry, the actual source of the money that goes into the f water body funds is largely from taxpayer money, right? Not originally. Originally, it was mostly donations because there wasn't a place in the public works budget for the water bodies. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't there. And so a lot of things happened, and you had to take special actions, and that was done mostly through the conservation efforts, for instance, at the reservoir. But then they let that go for a while and we had the water chestnuts problem. Yeah. And so this is, this is a little bit different. You've helped us so to establish public art and in order to raise the money for the mural that now exists at the Boys and Girls Club, we had to find a place to accept the money and it is at the Center for the Arts and they have a special fund for us. But we're rather, I don't think we're uncomfortable, but I think we think it's more appropriate since we're working with you on public art to have it within the town. And so uh, as recommended by our town council and the town manager, we went this route. And um, I think there is a place in town that will uh, be able to manage this money or at least receive the money and uh, if the town manager might want to tell you about that, but I am aware of that now. Okay. But I guess I'm going to stick to my, my original question, though. So if we look at the money that's gone into the public water, the public water fund, body fund, like the town has appropriated more than fifty thousand dollars into that for two years. Right, but yeah. I mean, we're talking about in the total actually one year. But the, the, the total amount. donations that have gone into that fund are just about that. About that. So it's, yeah. Okay. And, but whereas this one, though, we don't really envision town appropriations going into it. Not yet. 
No, we, we uh, in fact, <laughs> I have my ad for one that's happening this week. Mm -hmm. And on Friday night, there will be a program at the Center for the Arts, because it's a nice, cheap place to have something on Friday night. Uh, and it's a retrospective on some of the works of George Plimpton. And so there will be uh, pieces of his, uh, you probably know of him as the editor of the Paris Review and also through Sports Illustrated with incredible uh, actions. And there you can see him with uh, Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic playing percussion. You can see him uh, with John Wayne in Los Lobos uh, film, and you can see him at the circus. And also there is a wonderful C-SPAN piece on how the Paris Review and other literature happened with uh, Truman Capote, Norman Mailer, and George. And of course, all this is made possible through Oakes Plimpton, his brother. Uh, so this is a program that will, again, raise money for public art. And until we have a place to put it, we hope that we can go to the legislature and have that ability to create a place to do that. I guess I'm trying to understand, my, my point being is the public water bodies was to me a vehicle for public and private donations. I definitely and think it, of it, it as, definitely the was. The, as the taxpayer. I don't see this fund as being similar in that way because I think if this is getting private donations, so I'm trying to understand why the town is being choose, chosen to be the, the holder of this money when it's not, uh, when, when it's not for public appropriations. Um, the, the Water Bodies Fund also collected quite a bit of public money. It I still understand. does. I understand. So people can donate to it with legacies, et cetera, um, memorial gifts or whatever, or you can raise money for it. This is exactly the same thing because public art will cost a lot of money yeah, or, or not so much money. But at, the, at this point, everybody is paying for it them, out of their own pockets, all the work that's done. Okay. Yep, Ms. Mann. Um, I'm, I'm going to liken this to maybe it might go what you're trying to get at, and I can't even talk anymore. I've been in so many hospitals. Sorry. Um, when, what I'm trying to do is find a way to get this done. And if it's special legislation, that's fine. But I, I want to liken this to, and I don't know if it's a similar analogy, but when we, the sports user group, started fundraising down at the high school football, soccer, lacrosse, everything complex, um, one of the issues we had when we were going to get donations from, you know, different people, Bill Armstrong or from the state, um, from, uh, I think then it was MDC, I can't even remember, was that we, people had said to us, well, before we gave money for a new school board, it's still not there. So we went to the school committee, and I'm not sure if Mr. Kiro was on it then or not, um, and we said we're going to fundraise for the school board, Bill Armstrong. We're going to fundraise for the lights that's uh, Haven getting money there. We're going to fundraise for the concession stands. That's this um, Arlington Soccer Club came through with that. And then Pop Warner, we're going to fundraise to get the new golf cart and stuff like that. And what the school committee did then was they created a line item in their school budget so that when, you know, the Bill Armstrongs of the world were asked to make out money to pay for things, individual things, it went to line 40E. The money went there, but then it was overseen by um, the sports user group, the group that the school committee then created, with the school committee ultimately overseeing the funds. I'm just wondering, is that something that we can do in this case? I want to get the fund established so that you can get public funding in there, and, and if you're successful with the CDBG or something like that. Um, I, I know this is hard because this was a school committee thing, but that's how we did. It's sort of a similar effort. We wanted to fundraise to get things done piecemeal, and we continue to use it to this day. Um, is there some way and or maybe town council can investigate this. We can do the same on the town side. I, Basically, we're setting up a line item so we could perhaps I, put the money in the town's coffers. We could we could set up a strictly gift account, but I, I think what uh, Ms. Howard's getting at is an account that has the flexibility to accept gifts, accept grants, and accept potentially down the road town meeting appropriation if a reason was, was brought forward for that. Uh, so accomplishing all of that in one fund. Well, like we got state funding through Senator Haven, and it came out of, um, it wasn't DOT then. 
and it was able to accept that. So I'm, I'm saying, where's the difference? I have to be honest, I'm not familiar with okay. what vehicle that All right. was. I, I think, that's that's could, I, could I ask something? Uh, I think that one of the reasons that the Water Bodies Fund was set up that way was because the calendar doesn't allow treatments at the same time for every water body. In this case, we have the opportunity to accept a statue for the middle of Mass, the new Mass Avenue corridor or something, but you have to be able to handle that then or you lose it. It's, and so if you have to return all the monies that you collect in a fund that aren't used to the general fund the next year, you don't have that money anymore. And this would be a repositor for gifts, grants, whatever. No, and we do that, that's what happens at the high school. It doesn't go back to the general fund. I'm just trying to get it accomplished. I know we're saying water bodies and people may be getting confused out there. God bless you. We're talking about establishing a committee for public arts. So I think we need to. Not a committee. A, a uh, fund. I mean a fund, a, a line item. Yeah. No, no, no. Did you want to weigh in on this at all, Town Council? I think my point has been addressed by Ms. Howard. Okay. Mr. Kira. Well, thank you. Um, Oh, sorry. No, no, you're fine. I went already. I'm shooting it for my second time. Oh, okay. okay, okay. Um, well, first of all, I note that town council has, has looked at the water bodies language, and you're probably aware of this, that uh, including borrowing, that, that can't be in there. So if we, if we go forward with this, we, we can't include the borrow, borrowing line. Is that what I understood? Correct. Because you can borrow for public water bodies, but you can't for public art. So I guess that's an important thing to, okay. to realize. Um, I don't one, think it exists here in this warrant. Actually, I think it's in the summary that we were given. We were just given the language of the water bodies language and, and as the model for this. Yes. And, and the water bodies language says including borrowing. And we, not we, could not, we could not okay. have that for the public art. Um, do, do you, uh, Ms. Howard, or, or our town council, know, I mean, contributions to a fund like this would still be tax deductible? Uh, under current tax law, who knows what's going to what's going to happen? But I think has that worked? That that that. I think so. Yeah. yeah, they are. And then the other question I had was, um, if contributions are made into a fund such as this, and a project were identified um, to expend money on, what if that project is on private property, such as the the mural project down at the Boys and Girls Club is on a private institution? Is there a restriction on using the public funds for something like that? Well, any funds that are um, accepted either through appropriation or gifts or grants by a public entity, which as a subset of Vision 2020, this group is, need to be used for a public purpose. Yes, and that would be a public purpose, but it's at a, on, a, on private property, so. There's not necessarily a bright line rule between where the project would occur. There isn't. Okay. 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 I mean, I, I, I obviously I support this. We've obviously talked a lot about this as a, as a priority. We, we, we established the cultural commission. So obviously we have an advisory group that would help us, I think, help us to direct funds, um, appropriately. So as well as the vision 2020 public art committee. So, um, from what I know right now, I support it. I see a quizzical look though on my <laughs> colleagues face here. I apologize. I'm going for a second time. Did you? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I think I finally figured out what my what I'm twitchy about. Why would why choose this vehicle rather than a 501c3? Well, partly because the the pay, the organization that includes the public art group is a public group, and so I don't think we can become. We're a town group, so we can't become a 501c3. Uh, so here's my problem. Here's here's the thing that makes me really worry about this: is um, what about say we decide say some art for me is often edgy. It's often something that's mm -hmm. that's uh, not you know it, it, it's it pushes the limits sometimes, and mm -hmm. I really worry about. Uh, having an art process that's under the control of the town manager because I wouldn't wish it upon him. Uh, it's, uh, I think that you already set up the fact that that in art is, you know, this is a global thing. Music, literature, all kinds of things. It isn't only physical art. I understand. Uh, 
you already set up with us earlier in the year the fact that whatever would be installed would come through you, that we would recommend to you, yes, uh, earlier at, um, I guess it was in the fall, when we talked about cheerful and other things, we would always come to you. Uh, so. Uh, See, I feel like cheerful. you had to talk to us because it was on a public way and therefore you needed our permission to use the public way. But we weren't passing judgment on the art at all. I know, you were recommending that we would do that just like the cultural conference. I, I feel like this is, like, I think about things where I want things to exist. When I think about government function and I think about private function, I support public art. I'll write a check to, to the fund. I will try to encourage the public art and happening in Arlington, but I'm afraid I don't, I don't, this doesn't feel like an appropriate vehicle for something in the town. I really, I want, I support, I, I feel like I've been arguing with people that I agree with all day. Uh, you know, Adam Oster, you know, he's trying to change, he's trying to make it. I, I, I love Adam and I agree with him and I want to do what he was doing. And Jean Leary, she comes forward and she says, I want to do this thing and I'm recommending no action. <laughs> um, you know, I want to do a coordinated finance group and I'm sitting here voting no action. I'm sitting here arguing with people I agree with all day. Um, but I just don't feel like this is the right, the right vehicle for it. What would you recommend as a vehicle for people to be able to donate to such a thing? Uh, I think that the 501c3 makes sense and then in working in that, I can see a hand-in-hand -hand relationship between the public art group and a 501c3 and the, uh, the public art group would help to manage the, like the public aspects of it, like the rights of way and the things like that, but the actual dollars would be, cut, would be a private thing. I, I'm not a fan of using t uh, town money in any, like, uh, in any of these ways for, for the art projects. Hmm. Yeah. So I want what you, I, like the, the vision that I think that you have for having public art in Arlington, I think I share that vision, but I want to get there through a different path. I actually have a question with, um, and say with the <coughs> cultural council though that goes out and looks for grants, dealing <coughs> with art. Could this potentially fall the grants that they get, and, and that the monies that they receive for you know art in Arlington? Could we potentially add this public art under their purview? And so it you know, if they're already mm. dealing with grants and other funding. For you know, while it's not public art, it's still, you know, similar, you know, a similar category. And could we kind of align them at some point along this process so that the funding is still there and it can be I separate to, for? I yeah, I haven't been a member of the cultural council for a long time. Years ago, they get a certain amount of money from the state for the for the year. It's about ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and that's it. And they go out into the community, or they advertise and people come to them. Uh, this, I think this is a little bit different. This is just, just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I, I think it's time to move on. I mean, the, to me, the fact that it's public means it falls under us, friends. If, if people don't like, uh, you know, uh, uh, a statue that has been put on the mass corridor, um, in East Darlington, we should have had something to say about whether that was allowed or not, and therefore, um, you know, I think this funding mechanism for me is okay, but I'm not, you know, I don't have Dan's uh, mathematical financial uh, background, uh, but... This one isn't math. Yeah. But, well, but, you know, but you know, I mean, really, it, it's, uh, the buck has to stop here in many ways, and it, uh, to create this vehicle, I say let's create it and then let's see how it works, whether or not there is indeed any, you know, unless town council wants to advise me differently on no, this or something. Uh, I am uh, so moved. Second. Ms. Mann. Um, I just share a lot of reservations and even if this is successful, I still would like, um, I mean, I, I won't be voting in favor of it because I think the same vehicle we used to it's over a million dollars of renovations that we've had down at the sports complex um, from various bodies. If you could investigate with the school superintendent how they set that up to receive, you know, sometimes it was just 50000 sometimes it was 250000 but I know that it went through 
it sounds like what Ms. Ms. Howard is asking for. And then, you know, whether this is successful or not, if that becomes a, another avenue or option available, um, Ms. Howard may decide that, that, you know what, that's easier, that's quicker, that gets it done faster. Or Those not. are reserve accounts. But I just thought, I, one of the things that this is, well, this would also include maintaining whatever those things are. Yeah, right? we're maintaining the, um, we're getting the money to maintain the um, artificial turf as well as fundraising for um, the practice field, the money for that artificial turf. And, you know, we were replacing vehicles, we're, we're maintaining. You know, the scoreboard went down and the press box, we got the money for that, and it just sh shot through. Mr. Dunn. I'm all over the place, I apologize. You, you just actually said the right words for me, which is the maintaining part of it. And that is something that we have, that, that is something that once we own it, we have to do it right. And so I'm back, I'm, I'm back ready to support this. I apologize. I, I, I was, I can, let me just tell you what I was thinking about. I was really thinking about, um, I had in my head the model of the public art, which was the temporary displays and the, things like that. But I'm now realizing the scope of this is much more than the temporary displays. This is the Uncle Sam statue and uh, and um, uh, contemporary the, the museum um, public art owned by the museum yeah okay and so that broader scope brings it back to something that I'm uh, I, I was very much on the uh, a different wavelength than I'm sorry welcome back Dan thank you <laughs> further discussion I'll look, no so Mr. Chaput has huh say oh Mr. Chaput. Is there really something we haven't discussed, really? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I hadn't really expected to speak about this tonight, but let me give you my dilemma here. I've already talked with town council about this, and I don't want to muddy the waters, but there are some issues that are, are a little bit tenuous. First, the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum never got any money from the town, so we raise money, and we are a 5013C, and it works. Secondly, we had one meeting with the Cultural Council. Guess who got appointed to be the treasurer? But we don't have any money. The commission. And we have no way to arrange to control the money. So my conversation with town council is how do we go about doing this? We're not really sure yet. I don't have an answer particularly for tonight's uh, meeting, but it's, it's an issue that we need to resolve. Now, whether the funds come from the art, I don't, I don't know. I really don't know, but I, we do expect that we will be taking donations and we will be receiving some grants. And so we have to have some method to be able to account for that money and then report back to you. So I just want to bring you up to date on kind of where we are with it. And quite honestly, the council will be re presenting a report, an official report to you prior to town meeting. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. I think you're, you're referring to the commission, correct, Mr. Mr. Chaput, the new commission, you mean? Oh, the commission, not the council, the, the commission. Right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, the commission, the commission. Yeah, yeah. It's going to happen all the time. I'm begging you. Can we take a vote on this, whichever way you all want to go? <laughs> Who made the motion? Something else. Who made the motion? Made the motion. Mr. Byrne made the motion. I thought it was second, second. by Mr. Carroll. Okay, right. Mr. Carroll. No Mr. Carroll. Mr. Carroll. Let's track. Anything else? No. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Was that your name? Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, it was, okay. I didn't, I didn't hear, I no. still wanna, do you I want still to abstain? No, no, I still oh. want, no, but I still want, if it's okay, ask the town manager just to have a brief conversation with the superintendent around that. Maybe that structure is appropriate for somebody else in the future. Right. Okay. Thank Thanks you very James. much. Thank you. Um, uh, article 27, I believe we're gonna table till April, April 1st. That's the endorsement of the CDBG. Uh, I do not believe on April 1st we're gonna be, oh no, on April 1st we're gonna be ready with the we're to be ready. By okay, April. yes. Sorry. But you're not ready tonight. So we, we are do not need ready to. tonight. Okay. So move to table. Move table. Second. 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 All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Article 28, revolving funds. Uh, uh, really a, 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 a what do you what do you say? Housekeeping. Housekeeping. Thank I don't you. Know. That's what I, I no. It is. It's All exactly right. what I say. It's a housekeeping That's the first article. Thing that I got it. Uh, each of the revolving funds, of course, would be audited and have to look have move to be looked at. Uh, so move favorable action. Is there a second? Second. Uh, right. No, you okay? I mean. Yes. I 
the manager is looking like, like he might want to say something or he might oh. want to let it go past. Well, I had a half an hour presentation on the fun side. So. Okay. <laughs> Move to tape. <laughs> no, but I'm I, sorry. I, I wanted to add there is one new fund that's being proposed this year. Okay. Which is for uh, House on Aging programs. This is a fund that had been, uh, was being treated as a gift fund in the past. Uh, however, uh, the Comptroller recommended that we establish it formally as a revolving fund going forward for this fiscal year. So I just wanted to mention that there was that additional fund to, to operate Council on Aging programming. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, Mr. Kerr, yeah, I just had one, one question. So we talked about the DOR report tonight. My recollection is one thing that the DOR report did point out was our reliance on revolving funds. I say as we just voted to recommend the creation of a new fund and we're looking at a revolving fund here. Um, as we look at creating new, am I misremembering? Uh, you could be right. I don't recall. I, 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 believe, I believe there was, it, it was highlighted that we, we do a lot of um, revolving funds here and we've, we've kind of had an explosion over the last few years. So as we look at adding funds, have we looked at the activity in some of the existing ones and as to whether they, they still serve their purpose. I, I just, you know, I look at the public way repair fund that had no activity this year and has a balance of $168. I, I, I suppose <laughs> um, a, a fund like that, we, we, we could under, undertake a, an analysis and see if it's even necessary. But uh, for the most part, if you look through, the, the majority of them are utilized very regularly and have... Yeah, a, a no, I see that of most of them do. But uh, some of them have had no activity at all, so... Just, just wondering. Yeah, no, it's a fair question. I'm not going to press it tonight, but I'm sure it'll be asked at town meeting. So, yeah. Okay, be ready. Okay. Anything else? So, uh, motion. Move favorable. Move favorable. Second. 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 All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed. Um, okay. So, final votes and comments. Move approval. Move approval of Article 13, 14, and 15. Final. Oh, okay. I had one. I had one comment. Okay, which article? Yeah, ask me. I'm sorry. I should. I should have noted it. There, the word against. Yeah, but which article, Joe? Can you just tell me that which article you're talking about? I wish I could at this hour. Okay. I wish I could. One second. Oh, this one, the, uh, an Article 15. Okay, uh, hold on. So Article 15. So how about uh, a motion to approve on Article 13 and 14? Second. So, so, so moved so so move by Mr. Byrne, seconded by Mr. Cura. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Okay, Joe. Article yeah, I've 15. got, I, yeah, yeah, it's just in the comment. I, I wonder if you could, if in the comment we could just soften that language. We have uh, the board voted instead to adopt a policy of formalized leverage against the utility companies. If we could say with the utility companies, I think it would just, it comes up, it's a little bit better. With respect to? With respect to, that'd be great. That's all. Okay. So that's your motion yeah. to, your, to amend that? Yeah. And you're moving approval on that final wording? Yes. Second. Are you okay, uh, Juliana? Sure. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Okay, uh, correspondence, motion to receive. Move receipt. Move receipt, is there a second? Uh, we move receipt and we second, and we uh, thank Greg Watt for his service uh, to the tree committee. Uh, he just mentioned in a letter to us that because of uh, a little change in his schedule, unfortunately he can't uh, any longer fulfill the responsibilities. But it does mean now this is the second opening on that tree committee because of the untimely bit death of Brian Murray. So, Marie, didn't we just recently go through asking for applicants to the tree committee? Uh, and I think we... Do we have some left over? I think we used them all, so yeah. I was going to ask if okay. you the appetizer. So, all right. So, so we, first of all, move a seat on the correspondence. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 aye all those opposed. So, yes. Uh, so, on the tree committee, the, uh, the number of spots on that committee is, is fluid. It, it does not have to be filled, and we did just put... Uh, four new members on it. 
I would actually ask that we uh, consult with the chair and see if she okay. would like new members. Good idea. And, and go from there. Good idea. Okay. Good idea. Okay. So, uh, uh, Marie, would Marie do that for us? All right. To see if, because of the two recent vacancies, does she feel? We have more than we needed when they appointed right. these last Right. Right. So uh, he's right. We should check with yeah. the chair. That's a good way to go. Uh, we do need to go into a brief executive session, so we'll do new business first. Uh, Ms. Grapelka. Nothing to add. Okay. Uh, Juliana. No, 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 Mr. Chapdelaine. Very briefly, I learned uh, late today that the Arlington Belmont Cambridge Joint Powers Agreement, which is, uh, allows for the tri community flooding group to operate, uh, was actually first enacted by uh, an act of the legislature which is due to expire. So there is uh, a, a bill before the Senate, which is being heard tomorrow. Uh, so the town engineer brought it to my attention. Uh, so I signed a letter uh, in support of the continuance of that joint powers agreement so that group can continue to meet. I'll share that letter that I sent with the board, but uh, just to expedite getting uh, support of that bill to the legislature, I sent that letter out today. Okay. That's all I have. Well said. Ms. Mahan. Um, I, I want to thank the town manager who provided us a copy of sort of an update on the comparable study committee. Um, and it's my understanding the vendor has been chosen and you're going to meet with the town and unions and other stakeholders April 8th or April 18th. Um, and I only raised that because Linda Hansen had um, raised it to me and I'm sure to my colleagues on there. Um, and so I, I want to, you know, I contacted the town manager and I want to applaud him for moving forward on that. And then the only other thing, I think the last person who got the hot potato was Mr. Dunn, but I'm not sure. I know years ago, Mr. Gurley, you were chairman, we established joint um, meetings at least once a year um, between the school committee and the board of selectmen. And we were successful for about three, four years. And this sort of highlights, and I don't want to open old wounds or anything like that, but in terms of everybody coming together on the same page, I, I know different members have tried over the past four or five years and that we haven't been able to open that door. So I don't know if either either the chairman or any of the two newest members or if Mr. Dunn, if you want to renew those efforts. I really think, um, I won't go any further with that, but I think people know what it is I'm saying. But I really think those are important. And they, when we have them, they, they, with the exception of one year, they were very constructive. Yeah, we actually at one point had a uh, liaison between the school and the board of select. Huh? What? I think we still do have a liaison. That's me. <laughs> but I finished what I was about to say. <laughs> but Sean Garbley was that liaison between the between the school committee and the board of selectmen. In one year, he literally made more selectmen's meetings than I did. I had been traveling so much, but I mean, he he, he had 100 percent attendance uh, at these meetings and stuff. So, have you had 100 percent attendance at the school committee meetings? Uh, I'm sorry to report that I have not. <laughs> no. But let's put it to Steve. Let's have Steve. If that's okay. Let's have Steve yeah. approach. Uh, um, uh, Kersey is the current chair, yes, right? Yes, yeah. yes, and I would be uh, more than happy to. And you know, the summer is the better time to be doing it, anyhow. Just because, I mean, although there's problems with vacations and everything, but but it is a better time in terms of trying to. It's it's tough to get the two boards together. We so we we've, we've danced with that a number of times, but I favor it 100. percent Are you all set on new business? Yep, um, Mr. Byrne. Two things. Uh, one, I'd like to congratulate the Allen Catholic women's hockey team. Um, they made it to the finals yesterday and lost in a heartbreaker at the Garden, but they had a terrific season. And two, I think I am going to uh, be killed for it, but I'd like to wish Marie Kropelka a happy birthday, which was celebrated the Related other day. Birthday. <laughs> and, uh, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> what, what birthday was that, Marie? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Mr. Curo. Uh, thank you very much. Just uh, two things. Uh, first, I, I went last week to the uh, MMA's legislative uh, breakfast um, out in Acton. A um, lot of discussion about the, the governor's transportation uh, bill and about uh, OPEB um, uh, re reforms. I will note that um, uh, given uh, I made one contact out there, um, which was interesting, given our discussion about utility polls, there was a representative, Kate Hogan, out there who mentioned when they were going around that she's been taking the lead at the state level with some initiatives around trying to give um, cities and towns more tools around this. So I, I uh, cornered her in an elevator, and, I, and I, I said that I would try to touch base with her, and I mentioned it to Representative Garbley, too. So we'll, we'll see if we can have some discussions there, because we talked about we, we really don't have a lot of... Um, uh, uh, tools and just lastly, I'd like to congratulate the um, 
the Arlington Fire Department on there, uh, sudden death victory in the Guns and Hoses hockey tournament. I brought my daughters down there on um, Friday night. We were walking in. They said, who do we cheer for? I said, you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> and we left while it was still tied up. But I would like to congratulate the firefighters. It was a great night, great turnout. Uh, just a long-term planning committee. Uh, we talked talk, the manager and I and a couple other people talked it over. We postponed the meeting. We're going to do it either just before or during town meeting. There just wasn't enough material for the for the meeting tomorrow, so we postponed it. Okay. Well, all set. Um, I have uh, two quick ones. The first thing is uh, I'd like to ask this board to uh, empower me. Now that we've done an evaluation of Adam, it is time to. Uh, sit and uh, talk with him about salary and uh, the tradition has been the chairman would do that sit with him uh, and then come back to this board with a recommendation if I could have a motion on that. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And the uh, final item I have under new business is uh, we do now have a vacancy on the Zoning Board of Appeals so we need to start the process of advertising and ask um, anybody who might be interested in uh, serving on the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, okay, Maria, is that anything else I need to? Yeah, we'll get that started. Uh, okay, so uh, now we, uh, I need a motion to go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation. Do I say the litigation? the case of Boris and Coughlin versus the town of Arlington et al. We're having this discussion in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the town and where the chair could not reasonably have anticipated the need for this discussion at the time this meeting was posted. Exiting only for purposes of internment? Oh yeah, uh, and, and we will come out just for the purpose of adjournment, thank you. So moved. So moved, sec second. second. Roll call. Securo. Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Yes. Okay. Thanks. So we do need to. Look at perfect timing. Oh, it's been gone.